Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Now we are going to do the complex camera microconference. And first of all, uh, thanks to our sponsors. We couldn't do this microconference without them, and it's, it's great that you support the community efforts. Then, uh, remember, there's an anti-harassment policy. Uh, it's in the website. Please go through it, and if you feel uh, that you're being harassed, please use it. And yeah, now let's go to the fun part. So, Complex Camera Summit recap. So yesterday, a couple of vendors, uh, Chrome OS, Video for Linux maintainers, and uh, Leap Camera, we joined to discuss about how we support complex cameras in Linux. Uh, we already support some of those cameras there, but it's, it's, it's complicated. So we, yeah, we discussed how, how can we improve the situation. Uh, we wanted to do it here, but it was, yeah. Uh, it's difficult to get tickets for everybody, and it's also we wanted to have more space. So, so we joined there, and, and this is a small summary of what we discussed yesterday. Um, this is what most of us agree on on that meeting. There's some disagreement by someone, uh, but Logan. But <laughs> but I think everybody except Logan agrees, and I think you agree to 99% of the slides. You you can scream at me. You can raise your hand to the points that you think are, are horrible. But I, I don't think there's many horrible stuff there. So first of all, it's like, yeah, complex cameras. Uh, why is this complicated? So there, there's two aspects of complex cameras that make this complicated. One is the technical part. We're engineers. We can fix it. The other one is the political part. Yeah, we have never been trained to uh, have. Uh, yeah, We are not trained for that, and that's the part that is more, more complicated. So. Just to give you a, a broad idea of what is going on, um, when we want to support complex cameras, <clears throat> first of all, what is a complex camera? It's usually the cameras that live in your phones or the cameras, the uh, MIPI cameras that exist in modern uh, notebooks. Um, when we want to support those devices, we have some problems, right? So first of all, uh, if we want to use it video for Linux. So for memory-to-memory -memory ISPs, the abstractions, they are not really useful. We don't get too much from them. So formats, controls, pipelines, sub-devices, it's something that doesn't give us anything extra to, for, the, for implementing these drivers. Then when we want to uh, obtain a frame, we need to do a lot of IOCTLs to get a single frame. So we need to enqueue a lot of buffers. We need to dequeue the buffers. And all of those operations are expensive, and, and they take time. Uh, then. There are some features that are we missing in video for Linux, for example, fences that will aviate, that will uh, reduce the needs of some of these IOCTLs, but unlike, uh, unfortunately, they are not implemented in video for Linux. There were some attempts to land fences in the past, but they didn't succeed, basically, because they, didn't, they couldn't prove that they were useful. Um, there's no abstraction for advanced scheduling, so when we look into these complex cameras, there's a way uh, you send multiple buffers to the camp to the ISP, and the ISP can make some decisions which of the frames are more important than the others. Imagine you are with your car; some of the, those buffers are more important than it's. It's better than you crash than you not crash if your Skype conferences crashes. Um, then it's support for anything different than a frame. We video for Linux is based most of the time in frames, and slide support is it's it's missing. Um, Multi-cameras and multi-context support. Uh, multi-context is, is going to land very soon. Uh, Multi-camera fusion, I think there's no API there yet. Um, and then when we want, uh, Video for Linux is based on, an, it's, it has an ABI. And if we want to modify that ABI, uh, we need a big consensus with the community. We, can, we have a special device that is, something, is doing something unique. If we want to make an ABI for that device, we need some consensus and standardization. And sometimes it's for something that is, is one of. And yeah, so, so when we look if how can we implement these devices in, in DRM? And because sometimes when you look into these devices, these ISP devices, which are memory to memory, they are they look they could 
look like a, a GPU, right? You, you send a buffer and you receive something in the output. And what is the technical challenge for doing that? So first of all, if we support the same hardware in two subsystems, uh, there's going to be a big fragmentation in the ecosystem. So we are going to divide our efforts in, in two worlds. And then DRM people, they are not, uh, there's not that many camera experts in the DRM subsystem. So that, that is bad, that is a big challenge. Um, <clears throat> the other is, if we, in, in, in DRM, the uh, API is, is, is custom. You don't have a, a high level API like in video for Linux. When you implement a custom API, you need to introduce some trust into the vendor in that they're implementing that API in a way that is secure. You don't want that API to be able to control uh, the MA engine. And you need to trust the vendor and reviewing that code is, is more complicated. And then custom APIs are more challenging for user space. It's, if you need to make an application, it's easier to support one API than one API per, per hardware. And of course, they are reviewed much less than, than a standard API. So this is the technical part. And we got a minimal principle, a minimal agreement, which is that video for Linux, we want to get a complete list from vendors of what are the features, the technical things that are missing in, in video for Linux to support complex cameras. We want to fix it. Uh, and if it cannot be fixed in a reasonable amount of, of time, we will not block memory-to-memory uh, -memory ISP drivers in DRM subsystem in principle, assuming the DRM people want it. Uh, we cannot block this development for years just because we cannot uh, have the same, the same performance, the same features. So that's for the technical part, right? And that is the easy part because we are engineers and yeah, this is easy. We are trained for doing this. Now the complicated part. This is the, the non-technical discussion. Um, yeah, and just to give you some background, but what is the problem? So the problem is that some ISP features cannot be documented by vendors. There's reasons for that. One of the reasons is some of these features, they might be patented. You cannot even look into a database if this feature is patented or not, because then you are tainted. Uh, and then some of these features represent a competitive advantage to these vendors. So this means that uh, when they, they want to differentiate to another vendor when they make their ISPs. And of course, and they, they, are not, they don't feel comfortable releasing uh, the information of how to use this feature and how this feature works. Uh, then in video for Linux, we have the policy that the, we only allow uh, control loops, proprietary control loops in our API. We don't, we don't, if there's something that needs to be controlled from user space, we need to have all the documentation for those bits. We don't need documentation from things that are written from the kernel to the hardware, but from everything that the user can control, there should be a documentation. Uh, and yeah, in, again, current, the current video for Linux policy is to disallow any, any use of undocumented features. So you cannot have any way for using these features. And there's also the big fear that if we introduce a mechanism to use these uh, features, uh, then most of the driver is going to be undocumented and there's, yeah, then the driver is going to become useless. And yeah, we, this is the, Problem, and no, we didn't agree on anything. <laughs> we, and and we, need a, we need your help to figure out what is, uh, how other subsystem is doing this, if, what, is, what would be the right policy, what would be the right solution for this. And, and we are going to have two hours to, to discuss about this. There were some solutions on the table. One is that why don't we describe a canonic and ISP? We can say, okay, this is a basic camera. This is what a basic camera should do. Basic camera should be good for whatever we decide. Video conferencing, taking photos. Uh, and then uh, when a vendor wants to publish a driver, the driver needs to be fully documented for those canonical features. This ABC needs to be documented. Everything else, you can uh, use it via a vendor pass-through. Uh, this is a mechanism that exists in other subsystems, and it can be used for, yeah, can be used. But it has challenges. One, is it, of course, uh, one is that vendor pass-through uh, uh, pass security is complicated. 
I mean, how do we guarantee that this pass-through is not going to affect the original pipeline? How this pass-through is not going to write into the DMA engine and screw the memory? Uh, then is that even if we have this canonical camera, we are going to need vendor support to use untested combinations of sensor lenses. What does it mean? You have a camera. The camera usually is tested by the vendor by a specific combination of sensors and lenses. And a lot of the calibration is based on these three components, the sensor, the ISP, and the lenses. If you modify one of the, any of these two extra components, you need to retune the ISP. Retuning the ISP means you need to know a lot, you need to know a lot of things about the hardware. So what happens? Uh, shall we only have support for combinations that have been tested by vendors, or uh, should we allow any kind of combination? Then the problem is defining the canonical ISP. So most likely have a very different opinion of what is a good uh, camera, a good, a good enough camera to another person. So if you ask me what is a good enough camera, I will tell you a camera that can be used in Chrome OS. But that's because I work in Chrome OS. If you ask somebody else, it's going to give you a different definition. Finding what is the common, what is the canonical camera, it's, it's complicated and we need to find a way to arbitrate what is a canonical camera. And then the other challenge is what if we say this is what you have to do, and then vendors don't implement anything else but these very basic features. Are we limiting the innovation to our vendors just by saying you only need to implement A, B, and C? Then we have another proposal, which is, yeah, vendor, don't tell me anything about your proprietary stuff. Uh, just document me, document what is used, document the basic features, and everything else cannot be modified ever from user space. So if any of these uh, advanced, modern, secret features, they cannot be modified. From, they, can, they will never be able to be used from user space. You can have your uh, out of tree driver that can support it, but it cannot be upstream. And then the, the, the challenge there is that if we tell to the vendor they have to support a downstream driver, they will most likely only have a downstream driver and they will not give us a driver for the canonical camera. And then having a driver that is downstream is very difficult to maintain by distros and uh, yeah, every, it's an out of three paths. Uh, it's everybody that has been dealing with out of three uh, uh, drivers knows how complicated is that. We have two hours today to discuss. Uh, I hope we can hear your opinions. We need help. Help us. And yeah, um, that, that's it for, for that part. And then we were all specifically talking about the IPU6 driver, the IPU driver from Intel. Uh, it's, it's been quite popular recently because it's for different reasons. And the, uh, yeah, we want to be able to use those devices as soon as possible, right? And Intel has released an ISIS. So the hardware from Intel is divided in two parts. One is the capture part. The other one is the ISP, the processing. The capture part has already landed uh, kernel upstream via video for Linux. And Intel, they have a prototype uh, using DRM for the, capture, for the uh, ISP part. The decision to use DRM was technical when they looked into the I, they use video for Linux, they, use, they look into DRM, DRM matched, they, it matched much better what their hardware was doing compared to their, that's their opinion. That's what Intel is saying. It's not what I'm saying. I'm, it's not, that's what Intel has said. Uh, Intel will share the details of why they have chosen this. And what we agreed is that there are two discussions in the table. One is, how the data flows from the camera, and the other is what kind of openness we want to the camera. And the compromise from the Binary for Linux, the people from Binary for Linux that was there, is that first they are going to review the data flow, and once we all agree on the data flow, we will take the discussion of openness, which registers should be described, uh, some registers, which, 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 which registers cannot be described. And that was, Eight hours of fun, intense fun yesterday. Uh, More than eight hours. What? 
More than eight hours. But it was fun. We had fun. It was the first time we managed to have so many vendors uh, in the table with us. And so we, we are very happy to have this conversation. And at least I think we have, uh, we know more about the other stakeholders in DRM, in DRM. We know about all the stakeholders when we're talking about complex cameras. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's all from my side. Yeah. If we could go back to the technical premises, so because I think if we don't set them straight, it's probably hard to have a discussion on, on what's coming next. Next. So first of all, I would have liked this discussion that happened yesterday to involve all the people here and not be done by closed door, mm -hmm. because the technical discussion I think is worth uh, an analysis. So at each point. If you, I understand that something, it's like fences, is not implemented in video for Linux. Like fences, you're right, they're not in video for Linux at the moment. For each of the other point, uh, I think we could go in great length and discuss, like the first one, I have myself implemented that upstream an ISP driver for the Raspberry Pi, which has a single entity. This is not a requirement, this is an opt-in feature. Controls, pipelines, that's not something which is mandatory. No, nobody's saying that it's mandatory. What it's saying is that this So it's not a technical challenge then? The technical challenge is that we don't have any added value from all those video for Linux abstraction. And nobody forces you to use those. Yeah, but why I'm going to use a subsystem when it doesn't provide me any, any added value? <laughs> because it has other means for... It, it has been used for other drivers. Yeah. We have been using those... Um, we have been using entities for uh, the upstreaming of the Mali drive, ISP, an example, because it allows to do validation of parameters. But for other, we haven't had to do that. And also, when you speak about tens of system calls for obtaining a frame, I can count QBuff and DQBuff, or maybe like five device How nodes. How many buffers do you have to queue to get one image? You need to send control buffers. You need to send. You need to receive an image and no. the control buffers are not are not only one. How many of those do you have? That depends on the architecture. Yes, but we have seen cases where there are tens of them. Absolutely, but... No, ten. Ten, not tens. Ten. And maybe ten. that's even ten. And also when you talk... You have been there in the discussion. We presented multi-context support. That was Monday. And we talk about multi-camera, which is something that is... Mm -hmm. We discussed on, when, on Tuesday. That's something that doesn't relate to video for Linux. That logical camera happens in user space. So it's not something... It's missing as a feature in the, fra in the framework. That's... It, it's a different level of, of abstraction. It's personally, since we discussed it a lot, I'm a bit displeased to see this kind of points here because most of them are fair to debate, but presenting them as technical challenges, to me, it seems like misleading, and I'm very displeased about that. Okay. You, you, you need to understand that when we... First of all, the conversation happened yesterday, and we had four hours to make these slides, and this has been the common agreement between everyone. And I disagree with everyone. Disagree, then. <laughs> and, that's, and that's fine. I mean, that, that, this doesn't represent your view. And that's completely fine. But that represents the view of the people that has been in this meeting. Not mine. Which one of the, I mean, we can discuss which one are the points that are here, but we have edited most of the slides to satisfy, to, I mean, I don't think any of these points that are in a slide is something you have you disagree on, otherwise we have, we have been removed them. Uh, oh, okay. So the, I agree with Jacopo, for instance, for the first one. Uh, I think it's misleading to say that there are lots of features in VFL that are there and there are abstractions uh, if we don't need to use them, and I think that VFL provides value. Uh, and we, I mean, we could go through, uh, through all of these. If you think about and things is, like no abstraction for advanced scheduling, there's none in DRM either. You don't have a DRM no, user space API. I'm not comparing against DRM. I'm saying you are on the next slide. So you you're listing points here that are technical, uh, presented as technical challenges for VFL2, telling the audience VFL2 has, has these problems, and saying on the next slide, with, with uh, considering DRM as well, and you, uh, you're silent about the fact that they don't exist in DRM either. I think that's misleading. There's, there's no need for advanced scheduler in DRM because you can push whatever data you want. That you don't need that API in. Uh, in DRM because you can control, you can give the uh, hardware exactly what it needs to do the scheduling. 
That's so a difference. You can do that in Video for Linux too? Not today. I mean, you need, it's something we need to implement and agree on, but it's not there yet. Of, I'm not, all these challenges, on most of them, we can say that we can try to fix them. Right? No, no, that, that, that's something. I mean, the scheduling, if you have a single client in user space, you can do it in Video for Linux today. Uh, I, it, no, you can't. But with that... Presu I'm, presumably with uh, uh, multi-context support. I presumably with multi-context support, yeah. you can do something yeah, like that. I, I, I'm happy to see that uh, we have made changes to the slides since I first saw them. Um, but I also, also feel that there is a bit of that, that, uh, that there are things listed here that are not really necessary of, uh, uh, technical challenges or problems in Viraful Linux, although those exist as, as well. Uh, but, but we today, well, or yesterday, we came up with a good, good list of those that, that, that we, can, we can improve. But I think you also said that there is no uh, benefit from using the Viraful Linux uh, as, as such, but I don't, I, I don't think that is also true because uh, if you think, think of uh, ISPs, uh, some of them operate from memory to memory. Others can use sensor input as, as such. This, this, is just uh, for memory, this is just for memory to memory ISPs. Yes, but... This is only, we are yes, only talking here memory to memory ISPs. Right, right. Mm -hmm. but, but still, you can have the same hardware. Um, yeah, but in on an online ISP as well as offline, inline ISP as well as an offline ISP. So then you would have uh, two different APIs. That's, that's a different discussion. Uh, but, this but, is specifically uh, well, for, for memory to memory devices. Right, but I, I don't think that memory to memory uh, operation is something that uh, defines a, a nature of an ISP in such a way that it should have an entirely different API. Oh, that, in, I think, that indeed increases the. the, the uh, the uh, interop uh, interoperability challenges in the in the ecosystem. So so. I mean, do you have set of features that you cannot that you don't want to use? They don't offer you anything. I think well, we can agree that, on that. In we, that we can case, agree that those devices don't yeah. use controls, don't want to use uh, formats. They don't use the pipeline. They don't use they don't use sub devices. Right. Yeah, but this is we are talking about these specific devices that don't use any of the features from Video for Linux. Yeah. In some ISPs. Sorry. Some ISPs are scalar, and we decided to represent them as sub-entities because validating the link formats within the sub-device, within the, the entities, allows to do validation of the parameters formats. That's correctness. But it's also correct that there are some devices that they don't use those. They don't use any of those features. I agree with that. And, uh, and again, that's what they've, that's, we've been that's upstream one thing. of those not longer than two months ago. And that's, that's, what this li that's what this line is saying. Yeah, but not, it doesn't say anything more. I agree with that, but that's not a technical limitation of V4L2. You, you could say there are features I don't want to use, and that's totally fair. Nobody disagrees with that. Mm -hmm. But saying that this is a challenge, I don't see why you would like to present that as a challenge. That's my point. It's a challenge that you have to implement. Uh, you need to implement a lot. You need a lot of overhead by using when you make, when you implement a driver. The driver is going to be bigger and more complicated because you need to implement. You need to give support to features that you are not going to use. Again, they are opt-in. Nobody is forcing you to support them. And while we disagree on that, could you maybe expand the last point because with that one I really had trouble to understand. Subsystem ABI, you mean that if you make modification to video for Linux, that you have to modify the whole subsystem, I presume? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, let's say we need to implement, uh, and we need to implement a new feature, uh, because a specific ISP has a specific feature. Uh, if you want to do that in video for Linux, you need to modify that in the core, right? It depends. I mean, the only end, we, we don't have been, we, not, we, don't, we disallow, um, we disallow uh, custom IOCTLs in video for Linux. No. Yeah, no. no. Yeah, we do. No. Yeah, we do. No. No. We never disallow. Hmm? We never disallow. It was never disallowed to have custom IO cons. It's just that up to now there were no need for that. Okay. Uh, I guess in the past we actually had one or two drivers that had, 
but they were just uh, versions of existing ones, so those were converted, but just like that. I mean, nobody ever came to us if there any need of uh, custom IO control so far. There, uh, if I may say just a bit, uh, there are actually a couple of drivers uh, using, using those, such as the OMAP3 ISP driver, but since, uh, since that, uh, the same uh, uh, device specific configuration such has been moved to video buffers, so has been, there has been little need for device specific IO controls. Yeah, I, I, I can add a little bit to that. Uh, usually when a driver wants to introduce a custom IOCTO, uh, you discuss it and we discover it's really not specific to the drive. There are other devices that do the same thing. So then we ask to make it a, a generic standard IOCTO. I, I also, I think one of, based on the discussions that I had, uh, one of the differences between DRM and Video for Linux is that DRM always had MISA. So if you had a driver doing lots of vendor specific stuff, the requirement was, as I understand it, that there is a MISA support for it. So you have, because applications or user space, they are expected to use MISA as sort of the middle layer and MISA will translate to the device specific things. Now, if there are DRM people here who disagree, please let me know, that's it's just my understanding. Until recently, Video for Linux never had that. Video for Linux was MISA. It, it was the only way to talk to uh, video camera devices. So it was very important for us, given the wide variety of devices, to have a standardized API. Introducing vendor-specific IOCTOs, uh, you could do it for features that are really very device-specific, but they're actually really rare because almost always there are all the devices doing the same thing. So if you have lots of those video uh, uh, device specific IOCTOLs, it's very difficult to make user space applications. These days we have Lip Camera. So that is kind of the video for Linux MISA solution. <coughs> that might change the game a bit. So that might certainly given these types of very complicated pipelines, would it be interesting to make it easier to allow these vendor-specific things, provided there is a lib camera implementation? But that is sort of the political discussion uh, for these. I wish we had more times, time to work on these slides. So this technical challenge is basically it comes down to if you have an ISP that is directly connected to a sensor, then we have to use video for Linux, hard requirement. So we need to know, in order to support this, what is missing in Video for Linux. Uh, this is perhaps poorly written, but anything that a vendor thinks that is missing from Video for Linux, then, then after discussion we agree, then we need to fix that. It's just a fact. If you want to get that in, you need to fix that. So uh, perhaps this is poorly written and it really would need a lot. We, we need to talk to the vendors and really understand what their requirements are and how to implement it. But in the end, it's just, a, it's just work. Nobody disputes, I think, that we need to do this. The question is, uh, that, that is where it goes a little bit into the DRM discussion. If this would take a very long time, would it be a reason to block using DRM for such a driver? If that for many years is the only option to use today. Yeah, that's, that's a big question. I don't have a clear answer at this moment. I... Uh, so I've been working uh, for almost two years uh, on the RM subsystem too. So the model there is different from what we have on Video for Linux because on media, uh, sorry, on DRM, the driver is actually has the kernel driver which is basically just uh, sending commands to the hardware and allocating buffers and such things. And the actual driver, which implements uh, Vulkan, uh, OpenGL, uh, OpenCL, whatever, it is on user space. So it's a different model from what we have right now on media because, well, I mean, for normal hardware, the camera will just mm, uh, command that and the camera will do things. 
This is different from complex camera, so that's why we introduced a uh, lib camera. So with lib camera, we now have a user space component that can implement part of the kernel. Oh, oh sorry, part of the driver. So this is a, this is a different model, and it is, it is just a matter of vendors came to us and we find them a way to map. It is just like uh, any other solution, even if you will go to DRM, it will be the same. You need a user space component and a camera space. And we do have this on media. So it is not really a technical challenge. It's just a matter that someone needs to do that. So actually that uh, uh, what tomorrow say is good, that uh, there's different uh, driver models between the V4 2 and the DRM. However, I want to say this difference is good for the complex camera, ISP. The reason is that uh, we don't want to such complex processing in the kernel drawers. Just uh, you know, pass the command to the hardware, then kick off processing with the memories. So in case that uh, this is the reason that uh, it's fit. And also that uh, back to uh, Hans uh, questions on the, on the MISA, I think that uh, this is mainly for the KMS. However, is that the DM driver we are using for the complex camera ISP is mainly on the GM. So that no. this is memory to memory uh, processing, we consider this as the accelerators. Uh, right, I'm, I'm, this might take a while. Uh, buckle up. Um, <laughs> this comes down really like the architecture of V4L2 is not at all suitable for these devices. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that to you guys. You can argue with me, but I don't give a shit. It's, it's just not suitable. These devices are not designed to be programmed in this way. The same way as if I try to program a graphics card in this way it would not work. It is, it is the overhead of doing that abstraction at the kernel is too bloody high. It doesn't work. It's, if these devices are designed to be programmed, I think that's how, you, how the best way to sort of differentiate what should be in V4L so, and what should be in DRM is how are these devices sec, designed? Very, very, very quick, you're saying that uh, cameras, this type of devices shouldn't use be for Linux or shouldn't no. use? If they're designed in a way, like uh, the way the DRM was 20 years ago, was how video for Linux is, is, is now. And we, the hardware has evolved, and your hardware is evolving now, and your hardware is evolving probably around similar lines to what happened to us 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And we came across that problem, and we are like, well, how do we solve it? We have to move from having register programming drivers in the kernel to user space rings. Now, so I think the, way, the best way to, is not to decide this on like you know, DRM versus V4L2. It's, and I don't know enough about cameras to definitively say this, but if the devices are programmable in some sort of ring fashion, like if there's like a ring buffer that you submit work to, that the work you, you're submitting can be constructed in user space, in a, in a, in a, in a, on, you know, a less uh, kernel environment, like w without the security challenges and all that, you can construct that block of work and you can give that block of work to a device in some sort of ring and the, the device will then process that work and tell you when it's finished. If that's the programming model for your device, DRM is the subsystem that will handle that. DRM is not a good subsystem if your programming model for your device is I go into the kernel, I program 57 registers in a certain sequence and then block and wait. That is, the, the, the distinction is not should all these cameras be in one or the other, the distinction is how is the hardware designed to be programmed. And if the hardware is designed to be programmed in some fashion where you can, in a, I've lost word for what I'm thinking about here, but in a, a less, uh, you know, in, in the user space. You can build those command buffers and you can send those command buffers to the kernel and the kernel will fence you at the end and tell you I'm done with that and you can build buffers, with, you can build pipelines with DMA buff and use the fencing system that we've built in DRM. Program the hardware that way. That's the way it was designed. If the hardware is more of a stateful, and I, this comes down to some even the video decode stuff that's in video for Linux probably shouldn't have been in video for Linux. It probably should be done with DRM because Again, is the hardware designed to take a ring full pointer to something that's not authenticated? Like we, we do do authentication in the kernel for some devices. So like the older DRM devices had no virtual address spaces and had no, um, and I think some of the, I think the ISPs are probably in that area that they don't have like a, a good separation of kernel user sort of uh, places. But we used to authenticate the command streams in the kernel to make sure they weren't going to do something bad. If that's necessary, DRM could still do it. But I think it comes down to you need to think about this from the hardware design, what that implies, and not from this 
uh, there's, a, there's an answer that one V4L2 is the only way to do it, or DRM is the only way to do it. No. How is the hardware designed to be programmed? It may be different for every vendor. You need to get Lib Camera to be that user space API that everyone else is going to use. We had Vulkan, we have OpenGL. They are what drives us. Vendors put in extensions, and that's cool, but the vendor extensions are normally implemented by everyone. They're not normally usually that vendor specific. Uh, but having Lib Camera be the API will drive that. If, if you say, I need a Lib Camera user space driver for this, and you don't put the kernel driver in until you have a user space Lib Camera driver for something, and the Lib Camera APIs are what all of the other applications are using, your user space is using, the ecosystem will sort itself out. If your vendor doesn't come to the party, the market will push that vendor to the party eventually. It's like it's, we, we, we've cycled this stuff for a while in GPU land, and I don't see it being that fundamentally different for you. I, I think this is uh, very good. Gary. Okay. I think this is a very good statement for exactly for the what's the uh, complex camera SPS, right? So the, in the US space, the lib cameras, there's a special uh, flow, control flow, we call this as a 3A flow, which is calculate or comparing the parameters or command per every frame, so called uh, per frame control. Then this command is sent to the kernel space and uh, then that uh, setting the, uh, the hardware. So this the hardware architecture looks like for the complex camera. There's no anything that uh, we need to compare those parameters that inside the kernel drivers. So in case that the uh, DM is better fit per this gentleman's comments. Right? This, this device is our, uh, still uh, Quite different from from GPUs today, so and and probably also 20 years ago. So instead of uh, op performing uh, certain well user programmable oper or program operations very fast, uh, there is a pipeline of of different processing blocks uh, that uh, that uh, the configuration of which comes from the user space uh, control algorithms, but. Uh, but so 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 the what you refer to as a command, I, I believe, uh, uh, is is basically telling the the ISP of the process a frame, generally with with certain parameters. So I I think that the, in in some way that's similar, but there, the, yeah. it's important still to remember that there, it's still a fundamentally different kind of a device. Yeah, actually. Actually, in the DRM, it supports two kinds of the device model. One we call it as the DRI, which is for rendering. This is a traditional one. The other one is that in recent years that there is introduced a new subtree, so-called accelerators. So the accelerator exactly that requires the user space to generate those parameters and the command, send to the kernel space and pass to the hardware. And this is memory and the memory of processing. So, so this is the one that the DRM, so when we say DRM actually here today, is mainly on DRM accelerator, not on DI. Okay. I know basically nothing about GPUs, but in my understanding, the main difference is that instead of passing in common buffers that need processing inside the GPUs, ISPs, except for accelerator, with, in my opinion, as I understand it, are mostly MPUs, which is different kind of devices compared to ISPs. They are programmed through static parameters buffers. So they are just value that gets set and programmed on the ISP. There is no computation on going on the ISP. Does, make, make that, does that make any difference? In your opinion, I, th I think there's some computation there, right? You're you're giving you're setting so some weights. Maybe Those weights may are part of a. Maybe I should answer that because uh, that's I what I wanted to, to to say that it's it's actually the same. It doesn't make any any actual difference. There's one of the MP drivers I wrote. It's actually a command buffer, so there's commands which interprets, and what they do is just write a register each of them to some specific part of the of the hardware, and the other one just passes the descriptors. That's the same. And, and and it's really that what he said for uh, GPUs that may apply to these M2M video for Linux drivers is applies exactly the same to the MPUs. I'm doing. 
So actually, that, that, that uh, from my perspective, actually, I disagree that uh, the MPO is a static parameters. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. What I say is that actually this is the MPU in, in this one that the MPU and the ISP, they are very similar. Okay. MPU, you can generate the, the different coefficient and the parameters per frame. And for ISP, actually, we have the 3A control model running in the US space, which is generate or update those parameters per frame. So they are the same operation model. So going back to the, the comment from Dave, oh, there we go. Uh, when it comes to comparing to, to GPUs, first of all, we have no ring buffer. We don't have hardware operator on, on ring buffers. At uh, the hardware level, or possibly at the firmware level, because what matters from a kernel point of view is the, the interface that is exposed to the kernel, uh, we have a fixed pipeline. You can bypass elements. You can have crossbar switches in the middle, so you can configure your routing. But it's mostly a fixed pipeline of blocks. And then you have depending on the ISPs, a few hundreds, a few thousand, 10,000 of parameters. When you say parameters, uh, when people say I have five megabytes of parameters, that may mean that you have a lookup table uh, for some of those blocks that will contain half a megabyte of data. So we're not talking about five megabytes on individual integers that you need to, you need to compute. Um, and I do agree that the model is about computing all those parameters in user space, passing that to the kernel, and we don't want to have a fat driver in the kernel. For some of the ISPs we have today, uh, we, uh, we, we have drivers that take parameters from user space uh, and we we'll write those to registers with the CPU. Some of them use DMA to do that. Uh, that's really a hardware decision. Some hardware will have uh, DMA engines dedicated for that, some won't. Uh, so we have to deal with those, those kind of things. If you look at the Raspberry Pi 5 ISP, uh, that's register-based, uh, and the values of the registers are computed from, from user space. So we have a V4 to driver today from memory to memory, to memory device in the kernel where user space computes values of registers, passes, put that in a buffer, pass the buffer to the kernel, and that buffer will be, I think it's copied with the CPU in this particular case because there's no DM engine, uh, but if we had a DM engine, we would trigger a DMA operation to copy that. So the model that uh, we're looking at, we don't have a model with a ring buffer where you can submit jobs and the, G the ISP would process the jobs one after the other and, and, and go without any CPU interaction between those jobs and handle fences and all that. We, we may get there at some point, but the model we have today is that you have to submit a large number of parameters, like, uh, lots of data for each frame, send that to the hardware. You don't, you don't wait, you get notified, of course, when it completes, uh, but you, you don't have a mechanism when the, the ISP will automatically and silly go to the, to, to the next one without any interaction. And again, we'll, we may get there. No, and I might be confused, but it's not how exactly how the IPU6 driver hardware works. You have multiple, you can queue multiple operations and they're executed in order, in the order that you, actually out of order when you execute them. Uh, what I think what uh, it is or isn't is, you know, it's not material here. Like DRM supports both. So we have some where, yeah, you fill up huge command buffers and there's complex synchronization between multiple queues and some firmware just does it. We have others which are completely dumb. You know, they, they just take pointers to massive sets of descriptor tables. Like, if you want to render one triangle on most, uh, on quite a lot of GPUs, um, whether it takes one job at a time with the kernel filling the register every time the GPU is idle, or whether it's done from a command buffer, you can have, you know, like, 50 bytes of shader code compared to like 20 kilobytes of descriptor tables. So I don't think these differences are material because DRM supports both perfectly well, it's fine. What I have more issue to be honest with is, um, is the non-technical argument. Um, you know, when you say that vendors have no incentive to upstream drivers, you're you're sort of painting the community as held hostage in a way. And again, if we're looking at DRM, originally the ATI drivers were not done by ATI. They were done by the Weather Channel, who wanted them done and contracted Red Hat, I think. Um, oh, Precision, huh. ages ago. Anyway, so like they're there now. 
arm was done by Calabra originally because we thought it was a good idea um, and arm are now helping out with that. But in between Calabra saying, we think this is good, we're gonna sink our own money into it and arm coming to the table and really starting to support that, we picked up a lot of people who wanted open drivers and they were willing and motivated enough to pay for it. And that's what Dave was getting at when he said that the market will sort it out. If there's no demand to have ISP drivers in well supported in open source mainline stacks, then by definition, no one cares. If there's demand, generally people will sort it out, especially as you look at people starting to look at device sustainability. Rather than just throw away consumer devices, you have this stuff being shipped in industrial environments where you need quality and introspection and long support cycles. And that is the market pushing people towards open source. For the vendors who participate in that and do well, then that's a good positive differentiating factor for them. For the vendors who say, my stuff is too unique and too special and too patented, I'm only going to do proprietary things, then either someone will go reverse engineer it because I, I don't believe it's that it's, it's, exactly the same as it's exactly the same as GPUs. There's a big, big, yeah. there's a big difference. That's a lie as well. Big difference to GPUs here. The, the, the pipeline is long and you only get the result at the end. So if you have no idea what is happening in between, it, it, is, it is not configurable. You, you can reverse yeah. engineer on it. Yeah, it, it, it's doable, <laughs> trust it, me. It's an ISP is impossible to reverse engineer. You may yeah. be able to reverse engineer some parts of it, but you won't be able to. Yeah, but you don't need to get the perfect immediately. No, you do. That's the problem. No, no, you can't. Before you have everything, you have nothing. No, 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 no. Daniel, before you have everything, you have nothing. Have you got their driver? Sorry. Have you got a driver for the hardware? So which oh, hardware? Yeah. Uh, have you got a? Have you have a driver for a hardware? You can reverse engineer it. Doesn't matter what you think. It's been done for every single piece of hardware that's ever been created. There is nothing special about no, 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 ISPs. No, 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 no. It's special for special. It's special for ISPs. It is not special. No, 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 could you? Could you? Could you do that? to some of the complex ISPs first, then I believe it. Well, it's, it's impossible until somebody does it, yeah. right? That's the thing, because I, I think, I, uh, I think it's, it's wrong for us to accept those arguments as if it was valid. That was one about the patents, and the other one was about the competitive advantage, because those, we can believe those only if there are no open source drivers. And the moment if that they are, we see that these are not valid because uh, uh, the, the companies, the competitors, are already doing reverse engineering of those drivers. It's just that they don't publish it. But they know exactly what you are doing with your hardware. So, and, and I know that because we can do that as well. And, and just a single person can do that. So imagine if, if you are a competitor which has thousands of engineers and some of them are doing that. Of course, and, and, and they have the domain knowledge that we don't have even because they already know about how their own hardware is done. Uh, I think the open source community shouldn't uh, give much weight to that. I know that they all of them think about that, but in the same way, we already saw it in, in a, a, a DRM in Mesa. We know how all the GPU vendors are doing a variation of two approaches. <laughs> and with the MPUs, everybody's doing the same thing, apparently. copy each other constantly, and they all use the same engineers who move from company to company to design this shit. It's not, like, if you can get a lib camera proprietary driver that can drive one of these chips, you can make an open source lib camera driver that can drive one of these chips, because there's nothing hidden there. You can, it may look ugly and it may look brutal, but you can, you're telling me it's totally, literally impossible that to write, to take someone's code and recreate it. Like, what else are you going to do? Like, you have a lib camera API to say, I need to do a certain transformation or image processing thing. Mm -hmm. And then you need to translate that into a table of numbers to give to the device. Is that what the, the basic lead camera, The lib camera API will say, I want to enable denoising. You have one Boolean. Yeah. Underneath, there's going to be statistics that will com be computed from frames, so from a live stream. You get those stats that are fed to a blob. And the blob will take megabytes of stats and it will output, I don't know,
100 kilobytes of parameters that control the denoising field. Yeah, that, and you have but, one boolean to control that. But, but to free, that's fine. Uh, that's if, and that, 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 ha that half megabyte of parameters are computed, they compute it for every frame, and they vary for every frame in uh, ways that you can't understand. That's fine, because like Dave said, it is computation. Like, to phrase it more antagonistically, either ISPs are the most special hardware in the world and the only hardware which it is not possible to reverse engineer, or everyone working on ISPs is inherently less capable than everyone else working on other hardware. I don't think either of these things are true, but that's kind of where you're getting at. Like, They're I, not I've the most complex devices, but inherently different than GPUs no, no, from a reverse I've recently heard computer. this exact argument come back on people working on VR headsets, saying there's no way we can work out the fucking lensing crap and all that stuff dynamically. And one guy sitting in his room in Australia worked it out in a few months. <laughs> it's not impossible. And if you keep telling yourself that, you're never going to just get off on your ass and do it. Just reverse engineer one of them and figure it out. Like, that's how it happens. It's how we broke the GPUs. GPU drivers is how we broke. It's like, like no one could ever figure out how to program an NVIDIA GPU. It's impossible. How did you ever? It was the most complex piece of hardware in the world. Some guy sitting on his ass in Australia figured it out. You know exactly. Maybe what we just you, need you, more guys sitting on their asses you, in Australia. You, you, you know exactly what out. you're talking about uh, uh, when you talk about GPUs. But you're done when you talk about it. I know about it with XR, with OpenXR, for the, the, the VR headsets. That stuff was in, inherently the same problem. You had to feed in a bunch of stuff from one thing and dynamically do it at runtime to correct the lensing and that thing. And the guy figured it out. So and when, when you have registered documentation for an ISP, in most cases, when you have that, that's not enough, even with the documentation. No, no, you able to write but you'll also realize that they're not programming magic into the hardware. The values have meaning, and you will figure out that they all have similar meanings over time, and every vendor ends up programming nearly something similar. You, you can't because it's unreproducible. It changes for every frame you get in. So when you re reverse engineer a GPU, you control the input, right? Yeah. So you, you send commands. This is a memory-to-memory -memory ISP device. You control the input. You don't have to build the reverse engineer in the whole environment of having a camera feeding in frames constantly and doing that. You can control putting in one or two frames of black, white, green, and then seeing denoising. You, you no. can do it. No, because the control loop that controls the memory to memory ISP interacts with the live sensor as well. We have light sensor. It's you can uh, put another input. Uh, it's all actually, inputs. the major difference between GPU and the ISP is GPU is a stand for general purpose processor. And uh, ISP, actually, we build and integrate all the fixed functions with the predefined uh, algos. So give you an example that if you look at the high-level building block that the, the ISP from different company, it looks like almost the same. For example, we have the TNR. And the company A, B, C, they have different TNR implementations. This implementation will be reflect through the parameters. So if we, I have the company A's you know, documentation on TNR parameter versus the company B, then I can compare the difference that immediately tell me what, what's happened, that what they uh, you know, implement or modify, refine the TNR. So this is the same thing that they can do the uh, reverse engineering. So I just wanted to see if Maybe I could derail the lively discussion about reverse engineering. We do have devices for which we have documentation. For example, IPU6, we have open source implementations even. Like, I, I think the question that we can get back to is what's the right API for this? And I, I think Dave already made an assertion that V4L is not the right API for this, this sort of thing. And it, I think the Intel team agrees with that, but that's... That, that's, I think, the, the question that we're trying to get at here. And I, I hear a lot of discussion about the, like, the technical challenges or whatever, whether they're technical or not, I think is, is not the right question. Is like, are they challenges? What's the right API for us to use for this? Uh, so that, I just wanted to try and pivot back to that. So, what, OK, what Dave said, and I do agree with that, is that we don't want an API that forces a fat driver in the kernel that will do computation and big bang the registers. That's, that we fully agree on. I also fully agree on the fact that you can do that with DRM. But what I'm saying, and what I disagree with when you say uh, VideoFelix is not the right API, VideoFelix today does not force you to do that. 
it supports having user space, dr user space drivers that compute all those parameters, pass them in the buffer to the kernel, and it will be passed to the driver or to the firmware. The only thing that we want to have in a kernel, and that's device specific, is making sure that we validate what's in there so that there won't be security issues, that we won't have buffer overflows, that you won't oh. be able to disable a clock somewhere, that will lock up your, your memory bus in the, in the SOC. That is something we want to validate. That's a job of the kernel, because you have to, to consider untrusted user space. But we have today drivers in mainline, in video for Linux, that operate on a parameters buffer, and they just pass them to the hardware. So saying that, you, that video for Linux requires fat drivers, that's not right. Saying that DRM can support these use cases with drivers that pass the, the data to, to, uh, to the device, that is absolutely right. It, I, I just want to make clear that if you want to implement such a if you implement a driver in video for Linux, versus in DRM. You're going to have better performance in DRM because you're going to have less syscalls. Plus, everything that you send from user space to, uh, to the driver, in video for Linux, by policy, we need to know everything that is there. Right? Yeah, but that's not technical. That, that, but we, the policy is that we need to know what is, everything is there, which may... We can't discuss that. That's fine, so but most it's of not the, the technical language. So most of the time, we cannot just send the buffer directly to the, to the hardware because we need to recraft those parameters into something that the hardware consumes. Because the input and the output, that's how we usually do it. No, I mean, the, the Raspberry Pi driver doesn't recraft anything. Because in that case, you have the documentation for everything. But if you don't have the documentation for everything... You can do that in user space. No, no, no. You cannot create... Let's say... You, that in user space. No. They you, create a parameters buffer, which get passed to the kernel driver, which DMAs that to the hardware. If so that there's parameter, no driver expecting parameters that there is no moving around data. If that parameter buffer is because you have all the documentation for that for every single byte. If you don't have the documentation for every single byte, you need to recraft the you need to recraft it. Th that's not a technical issue. Yes. That's the but second that is part. What <laughs> Documenting all the parameters or not, that's not a technical issue. But we agree that we have much more syscalls if we need to implement a driver in iOS in, well, in using DRM versus as we, as we said, much more syscall is different than, say, we got tons or tens of those. Tens. I, I agree that queuing and the queuing buffer, there's been a discussion about going towards an atomic API for video for Linux going on since years, I think. We got proposed at that, and I think the desire from the community is to go there. That's, what, that's the outcome of the discussion that we have on, mo on Monday. So I agree, and everybody agrees, that it could be done better, but I don't think that mixing performances with the needs of having documented parameters or technical challenges is moving the discussion forward. So there is one part which I agree is totally political, which is the needs to document or not all the parameters. And there is one part which are technical challenges, which they exist, but they are solvable and the community wants to solve them. Mm -hmm. So if we want to keep the discussion separate about the two API, mixing the two, I don't think it, take, it does any, it doesn't, making the discussion so we, forward. we want to re-implement an API that already exists, which is called DRM. That, no, that's not true, because well, I, with I, DRM, you're going to use driver-specific OCTLs, and well, those you need to develop. They don't exist. No, that, 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 that was something I thought would happen over the years. I would have thought that V4L would have ended up just growing the exact same style of command me submission mechanism and fencing and all that stuff, that D and we would just interoperate with DMA buff between things, and it just never seemed to have transpired. It's like I, I totally expected this five or six years ago, I think I talked to you about, Laurent. It's, it's something that should have been there, and I don't know why you have, yeah, I, would, I, I, I don't want to be having camera drivers in DRM, really. It's not designed for that, but I would have thought by now that the need for this type of API without all of the extra stuff that's around it, like that you could, an, an optimized version of this would have transpired, and that doesn't seem to have happened. And that's where your problem is coming from. It's like V4L is still at that level where it's not optimized for the new hardware. And we went, we are, we've gone through this, and that's why probably what DRM is good for this, because we've already dealt with that problem. You know, we've had the upheavals two or three times now to have to up, upheaval the whole DRM system. Like it's, it just, but, but we did it. We got over it. I thought you should have started this five you, or six years uh, ago. Are you talking about DRM or KMS in this case? Both the whole thing. Like the like the original DRI was the big lock. Yeah. Like there was one user, and you had to take this big, essentially the lock. And then we went, no, that's an insane thing. Move past that. Like that was the one where you could program the registers from user space, but you held the lock. 
a new directly MMIO program, the, dri the driver from user space. That was insane, we admit that. Uh, the second iteration was more of the, we will validate every command, and, but this is hardware generation, it's hardware developed at the time. It's like the second generation, I think, is where you are now. We have to validate the command buffers to make sure they're not going to just DMA all over my memory. Now, we were probably, I think you guys are probably easier here because it, it's, it doesn't sound like the parameter buffers are generally a set of commands that will just DMA all over your memory, where we had specific commands to do that. It depends on the device. Yeah, it depends on the device. You're probably sending it to a firmware who you don't know what it's going to do with it. But that level was like, yeah, so we validate in the kernel that did we, uh, by the best of our knowledge, it's not going to DMA all over memory. We still have a few of those drivers in the kernel. They're not gone away. Um, and then the next evolution was when the hardware finally got proper uh, separation and privilege separation. And you could do, just give the hardware a buffer from user space and it had virtual address management. And I don't think ISPs are quite with virtual address management in context yet. Some are integrating platforms with IMMUs, some, yes, some, some are not. So some will get this again. And again, that's a different API again. Like the, they're not the same API. They're, drift, they're evolutions of the hardware that have driven the API. And that's, what, I think you guys are still haven't figured out that, uh, you know, you figured it out, I think, but I don't think you've realized it in terms of actually making it happen. It's like that your hardware is evolving and it's a totally different programming model or a different way of doing it. And you made, I think, you, I think you kind of got it when stateful and stateless with video, with programming, I, 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 but you didn't because stateless probably shouldn't have been in the kernel. Like, it's like some of that stuff could have all been generating news with, and I wouldn't be having to parse H.264 stuff in the kernel because that's not, you know, and it's like, but I think you just sort of on the, you know, DRM is there because it's easy and it fits the hardware programming model well. And, you know, if someone decides that this is a good way of doing it, I'm not going to say no because I, I, I don't say no to people with ideas that are in, insane and crazy because it's some generally it, it, that moves the market along. Are you going to say no if there's no open user space implementation? Yes, totally. I will, there has how, to be a how fully do we define lib an camera. Open, how do we define an open user there space There has to be a full lib camera implementation that provides all of the lib camera APIs that you think are important, like same as we, and that implements them all completely. And then if there's the odd zero in the middle of the parameter buffer that you don't understand. But what, what if I say that I want to make sure that you can have open source tuning tools for cameras? Is that acceptable? Yep. If you decide that lib camera, you, I, I, in this case, the user space is the same with, with Mesa. For Mesa, the basic requirement is that you implement Vulkan or OpenGL in Mesa. We used to sort of let, be a bit more flexible on that, but we've kind of said, no, you have to do Mesa now for that. Accelerators is kind of on that you have to show as a user space that does something useful for your device. We kind of lost with a banner labs. I do, that's the other thing. I, I, I'm flexible to see, let things happen, to see if they actually pull it off or if the hardware just dies and we don't care about it anymore. It's very rare that successful hardware hasn't just ended up doing the default thing of making a good user space. You might get the odd one that's bullshit, but they all die because the market forces them away. And you know, you got to be flexible in some ways. But I think if you can define a sort of a lib camera, this is what we believe is the necessary things for a camera should have, and tuning tools is part of that, and you know, calibration, whatever. And you define that, then you set that standard. And when someone in your group, someone goes, this kernel driver has a suitable user space, and here's the reviews, and here's the signed off by, we would merge a kernel driver. That's the procedure we, we've followed for up to now, and I don't see that, that being different. A couple of more points. Uh, full lib camera API support uh, is, is different from uh, IS, full ISP feature support. So you can imp imp leave a lot of stuff, almost everything out of uh, ISP support and still have full lib camera API support. Is, but is, is the goal lib camera support? That is the question. Like in, in, with the graphics cards, there's loads of stuff that we've never been able to expose. Is, because the goal no was just, can our users use it? That's, that's a, the lib, lib camera is essentially the Linux uh, yeah. camera API today. Yeah, and, 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 if, and if you need to add extensions to lib camera, or you decide that there's a new feature that people are not telling you about, get a lib camera API for that. that especially, what will happen is they will want to, exp like there's, what's the point in writing a kernel, a driver for an ISP that doesn't have a feature exposed to lib camera. You make that pointless. If, you know, that's how you make it pointless. That you make sure that any apps using a camera go through lib camera. Once all the applications have to go through lib camera, they're not going to want to go directly to some driver written by some vendor proprietary stack. No, they couldn't. No, they won't want it. And they, so then they will go, well, we need to put an extension in lib camera for some new feature. And then they come and go, well, we'll put the extension in. But then part of putting the extension into lib camera is now you need to tell me the details of open source that piece, because I'm not going to let your thing into lib camera without that piece. I think it, one point is very important here. 
is to understand the abstraction layers. So we have an ISP, and I agree that the abstraction layer there at the hardware firmware level is similar to, to a GPU. Works completely differently, it's not programmable with shaders, but you have, you have that, so that's fairly low level. We have a kernel driver, Video Linux or DRM, that's also fairly low level and allows user space to build buffers that it passes with parameters. I don't think that's fundamentally different at, from an abstraction point of view between the two subsystems. And then you use a space, on one side you have Mesa, Vulkan, OpenGL, so you know that abstraction level. To give an equivalent on the camera side, it would be a bit like saying, I'm gonna accept your kernel driver if you make it possible with an open source user space stack uh, to display a window with Qt or GTK. And whether that window and the 3D content in there is accelerated or not, you don't care. Whether you have support for the different shaders uh, that the hardware supports, you don't care. So it's a really big gap between the Leap Camera API, it's a much higher level than OpenGL or Vulkan. And that's where things get difficult, because if you say we want to support those features in Leap Camera, if I want to say I want to make sure that we have denoising, for instance, there are lots of types of denoising in the ISP. You can consider that you may have 2D denoising and temporal denoising. It's going to give you much better results because you accumulate multiple frames. At the lip camera level, you're going to have an API that says I want to enable denoising. And the vendor will say, OK, I'm just going to do 2D denoising. And with the, my close on stack, I'm going to have much better image quality. And there's lots of examples of that where it's very difficult. But, but if you compare that to Vulkan, uh, you have an API that's much closer to the hardware. What you express with the Vulkan API when it comes to rendering and shaders, those are things that are much closer to the device. So saying you have to implement that API gives you a very good chance that you have a really wide hardware coverage of the, of the features that are there. And that's the challenge we have here with cameras, defining the API and saying that's the standard. I, I think that's one of those problems. You have to build it and let the market sort out. You can't preempt it. You can't decide in advance that like, oh, one vendor just does the, the simple 2D denoiser and uh, that uh, the other vendor then was, is tempted to one-up them by doing a temporal denoiser and it, like they get the better image quality. So they're going to win more things. That's how you, you're going to have to do it. You, have to, you can't decide this in advance. I think you have to get to the point where you get the basic, because we've had this for a while. We've had like vendors with their own drivers who don't tell us all of the details of the hardware. And AMD it does that, and, and then we, but the open source one still won. It just takes a bit of time. It takes the market. You have to let the industry decide that they want these features. So uh, I want to make a comments on the API versus ABI. Actually, that for the lib camera, it's provide the API which is to enable the high level applications. And we can consider this, this kind of the, you know, a middleware that allow vendor to enable their hardware upstream layer. The ABI actually exactly the interface to the hardware. The one is that, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, there's a 3A flow. We call this as the IPA, the Argo part, which will generate those hardware payload and send this payload as a blob to the hardware that uh, through the ABI. So that uh, in case, uh, this is why I think that uh, the DIME is the better way that uh, to handle those kind of the complex ISP. Yeah. If you have a vendor that gives you a proprietary implementation, it's a data that is a block that you can reverse engineer it. Inject it into IDA, see what, see what they are doing, but you are, you are starting with a driver that is giving you 70% of the functionality. And again, the market is going to self, it's going to, it's going to, the market is going to self-regulate. If these trusts are going to distribute mainly the open source solution, so vendors want their features, they want their camera to look nice in most of the distros. I've heard you and Dave talking about the market here, and I think that's an important point. We've been working for the past nearly six years, that's when we started Leap Camera, approaching ISP vendors and SOC vendors, and you can imagine how difficult that is, so that's a process that takes time. And we're seeing an increase of interest uh, in what we're doing. We had very few vendors to start with, uh, and then that's expanding. And with every new vendor that we managed to get on board, there are two others uh, who think, well, maybe time for us to get there as well. That doesn't start at the top with Qualcomm or, NV or, or NVIDIA, obviously. Those are not the first ones you're gonna get. 
But no later than today, and I can't name that vendor, but I've heard someone telling me, okay, we're talking about a large important one, who told me, we managed to initiate discussions internally to get the cameras to be more open and to go with lib camera and to have open color drivers and, uh, and have the ability to have open source stacks, something that was completely unmanageable for them three years ago. And they told me, if you now allow vendor pass through, I'm losing that battle and the discussion will never happen internally. We have leverage on the market today because you're pushing them to be open. If we tell them you can do anything you want, we lost. The five, year, the, the five previous years of hard work we've done to but get the market there, that's going to be destroyed. I don't think you're telling them that by saying use the DRM architecture versus the V4L2 architecture. You control no, DRM versus, DRM versus you, Video for Linux, yeah, we don't. Like the market, but the level of openness they have to have, that's, I, I, that's the open talk. But the question. level of openness is driven by your lib camera expectations. If you even, like, you can also, like, Another way to drive the market is provide quality reports out of lip cameras saying, oh, well, we tested this person's denoiser and it's not as good as the other people. And say lip camera, and, and maybe you could set minimum quality requirements. You can set things that force things to happen as well. Like you have, you have the power to decide on every person's submission whether you think they could push it a bit further. And that's how, like, we've done that again. It's like you just, you, 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 there's no rule you set here that's a you have to dynamically engage with every single ISP that approaches you. And, you, and you're seeing the market already. By, by doing, refusing to do anything else, they have to come to you. Like, they're obviously saying what they're doing isn't working. Like, they know that they're not getting the sales they want. They're not, they've got these devices and nobody wants them. And they're not, you know, so they're, they're coming to you because they want to build a market for it. They know they need to come through you now. That's success. But you push that every year a little bit further and higher. You, you're not going to be able to push it to the end now. You got to, like, it's, I've been doing this for 20 X years now, and I've pushed everything a little bit every year, and that's where we got to. It's like, you just, you can't get to the end without iterating up. You find the friendliest vendor, you persuade them to do the most best quality thing, and the other guys will follow them. Uh, that's just the market. It, it, you know, and, it's, and, and the same argument from you it goes to the other side. We are constantly work the same argument that you are saying. It goes in the different direction. We have been constantly working with vendors that they cannot make the they are not willing to make their drivers in video for Linux because our because, because our policies and they will be open to release drivers that are good enough for users that are good enough for our for our use case in with the openness level that we have today if we give them another chance another vendor pass through. So it's the same. So the same goes in both directions. We are losing one. We are losing what we are losing in one side. We are winning in the other. The problem was never related to pass through. The problem is, and that's what we really want, and we really been fighting year by year. We want a vendor that I can have a camera, get image, and present it the right way, and that's what they are refusing to do because they want to do whatever fancy, weird algorithm they have, and they want this proprietary, they don't want to open, and the attempt to flip camera and other strategies is all about that. It was never about the actual video for Linux API. It's all about vendors wanting to get their proprietary thing there and not letting uh, users get the image they want. That's basically the uh, so so actually is that uh, one thing I want to mention, okay, people talk about the IQs, the image quality. The image quality is not determined by the software. Okay. The image quality is de determined through the tuning process. This will include all the Argos pipelines which will be enabled, disabled through the imaging uh, tuning process. And uh, the software will not to control it. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't agree with that. Tuning is extremely important, but if I replace today your binary uh, image algorithms that you ship with a gray world AWB, so just a software change, will the image quality be, will be the same? Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, the, what's, what's the term, the image quality? Okay, usually do the tuning is for the different lighting environment or the, you know, whatever the uh, implications, which is define those parameters 
will include dynamic and aesthetic to configure the ISPs. So that from the software perspective, the, the image algo is invisible to us, uh, just from Intel perspective, okay? We don't know this is uh, the TNR, we don't know this is the XNR, we don't know this is the DMOSIC, okay? And uh, this is the one, is through the algo uh, you know, uh, processing pass, like the three year pass, to generate those parameters as a blob, then send to the hardware directory, pass route to the kernel driver. There's well, the, the, the few things that I believe would be, would be good, good to clarify, but it's probably gonna take a few days. Um, going back to today's argument about what we require from vendor, I think we'll have lots of people in the room who would agree that uh, we should allow things to be merged if we set requirements on image quality and other things or features. Uh, and if the, the, the vendor reaches those requirements, then th that's good enough. Um, and I could also agree, uh, agree with that. Where it's gonna be probably more difficult to agree is what level of features, what level of quality, what level of, uh, <coughs> of, of hardware features that, uh, that will need to, to be supported. Uh, that's a dis discussion that I think we should have uh, because if we, if we leave today saying, okay, we agree that this is the way to go, no. we may not have an no. actual agreement. You do not need to agree on that, you need to negotiate that with every ISP vendor as they come to you. And you need to decide individual case, depending on your knowledge of the hardware and what they're willing to tell you, what you think as the expert in Lib Camera, what the base level requirements for those people to get that merged. You can't set, the problem with setting any static rule in systems like this is people game it. Yeah. You cannot do that. You need to negotiate uh, in a, in, with everyone individually one on one, there's no other way. Because we've tried this in thing and you'll, we, people have come to me over the years going, oh, well, we'll do this, then you're gonna, you, you, we gave you a rule and the first thing you did was try to game it. So people are always gonna try and game the rules. And you, you, you need to sort of, yeah, you, you can sort of go, you can give guidelines, rough sketches of guidelines, but don't make rules because the first thing that will happen is vendors will try and game you and they will. How much can you discriminate between vendors? Total, uh, it's up to you. It is, the, if you think it will help the market uh, by giving one vendor more friendliness, you do that. Like, I, 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 for instance, I'm, I merged the Samsung Exynos driver, which I think you're somewhat familiar, and Daniel certainly is. Not because it was a decently written driver, not because it was like a, a piece of hardware that was spectacular and I needed in the kernel. It was because it's the only ARM vendor who had submitted a driver at that stage, and it was shit. But it was good enough to put in the kernel because I knew it would create market force change in other vendors. I would never have accepted the Exynos driver as the second driver. It was only in there as the first one. I spent a lot of money getting it cleaned up. I spent a lot of other people's money, not my own money, uh, <laughs> getting it cleaned up. But that's the thing, you have to, you have to renegotiate every time. And you have to sometimes go back to the first guy and say, sorry, you're not keeping up anymore. You've never had a vendor telling you that it's not fair, that they have to they, they oh, yes, to, every to time. higher standards? Yes, all the okay. time, and I just tell them to go away and come back when they figure it out. So that means the community is fine with that? The community likes that because the community, what happens then is generally people from the first few vendors you're friendly with are your community. And they don't like you giving different, like they, they will, is, like, I don't decide this. I, I, I'm saying I decided this. No, the community has, the DRM community has decided the standards we will accept from people. And people approach me and I, I give them an opinion that I believe reflects the DRM community. I don't give them my personal opinion. I try to gauge, I talk to other people and then I go, look, yeah, no, I don't, we don't want your driver right now. It's not quite where we need it. And they'll come back in a year and they might go, yeah, we got to that point. And, then I'm like, and well, the, the, the scales have moved. You gotta go a bit further. And it's like, so there's, there's this constant, but it's, it's, it's a community decision. I'm, I'm only representing the community. It is not my personal thing. I talk to the people at Calabra. I talk to Red Hats. I talk to, you know, and I, I, I try to sit down with all of the, the people with the stakes. And when a new vendor comes along, it's like, what's the kind of minimum we really would let this person into the kernel away with? And again, it depends on the company, it depends on what they're trying to drive, it depends if there's, if there's market interest. It's, yeah, it's a complex problem every single time and you just sit down and have, have people in the community you trust to talk to as well and make sure they're representative of each ISP because yeah, no, companies get resentful if you 
if you set a gate for one company and they get over it, and then you drop the gate for the next one. So you generally have to make the gates higher, but usually that's pretty much the best way to do it. Then if the right, first, it's much better than the yeah, other way. And if the first company gets over the gate, you don't have to force them to get to the next gate. They can drift along for a while, and maybe they'll come up to the next gate. But that's to say, you set the quality and the you have to you know, make it happen. It's, and you raise the gate for the next generation. Yeah, and you just have to be arrogant about it. <laughs> I can confirm Dave's extremely arrogant. Um, no, like individually in isolation, some of the decisions he's made over the years and with SEMA as well have been incredibly unfair in isolation, but it is that ratcheting up, right? Um, and the ratcheting up does two things. One, it increases the standard and it increases the expectation year on year, which has absolutely happened. And the other is that it keeps the existing participants on their toes. Like, you know, I'll be very unfair and single out one person here. If you look at AMD, you know, they've been a really, really good participant in the community for quite some years. But when the whole Dell and DC thing came along, like that massively blew up into a huge public fiasco. Because, you know, they'd gotten in the gate at a certain level. They had participated really constructively and helped a lot of people out. But that level of, had risen and they, in some ways, gone a bit backwards. And so, you know, when they came to submit this whole huge thing, they found out that, yes, the barrier to entry is massively increased because that's where everyone else is now and that's where the expectations are now. And that is something you can ratchet up every year. It's frog in boiling water. And I'll just say, it is no fun to be the person that stops the work of 100 to 200 other engineers from going forward. <laughs> and it's not. And I, I get, imposter syndrome does get you with it. Like, it's like, why am I the person that's saying to AMD that 200 engineers years of work is not getting into the kernel? It's like, someone has to be, and you need to be, and, but you need to be negotiable. You can't draw hard lines. Can I add a use case to that? Because we're considering big companies upstreaming their work for their ISPs. But there are a lot of small business companies which are maybe very expert on image tuning. They know much more than what we do as a community. They know much more as what we do as a community about imaging. And they want to use ISPs. And if we allow vendors to not document features that they might want to use, but they don't know they are there, we are preventing them to enter the market using free software or using Linux in general, because we allow them, we, they, they don't know there is a feature on that ISP because it's not being upstream or documented by the vendor. And they may be small and they cannot afford that like upstreaming or supporting ISP by themselves alone, but they exist. There are a lot of those companies. We are seeing them every day, basically. That's how the market self regulates. Yeah. And that, if, you have a, if you have a vendor which has features A, B, and C, and another vendor offers A and B, you're going to choose the vendor that gives you most of the features. You are not going to choose that ISP because you cannot use it. And there's an incentive for companies, there's, a com there's an incentive for companies to implement more features because they will get more clients. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Intel wants to sell their chips to more people instead of less. Or, or maybe it's more convenient to have a big customer instead of having uh, hundreds more. Work. No, because, I mean, usually... But, but I, think, I think, again, if, again, if those people are talking to, like, well, well, we want to use libcamera to expose this sort of thing, then that's a point you ratchet up that API as something you should be implementing. And if, it, you know, and if they say to you, our hardware does not support that, you accept that. But if they, tell, if they say to you, we're not willing to support that in our hardware, well, that's a different discussion you have to have with them and be a bit more push back on them going, well, maybe we won't take your next set of changes, or we won't support your next chipset. Or we, and, then, and this is the thing, vendors per chipset, you can keep ratcheting. It's not like we let the vendor in, we have to accept everything from that vendor forever. Per release of a new chip, you can, every time you talk to them, there's a time to push that boundary. And you, can you handle incremental development with that model? If you say, OK, this is the bar that you have to reach to get merged. Uh, that means that the driver will have to bridge a big gap before that happens. While today, what we've been doing in video for Linux for the kernel side, but also in Leap Camera for the use space side, is okay, it's fine to go incrementally. Uh, how do you handle that? It, it comes down to do you trust the vendor? It, it's a personal relationship problem. It's like, yeah, do, does the vendor displayed that quality that I think I can let them get away with. I often find it's like, if the vendor has contracted it out to someone else to do it, 
and you trust them, that's probably okay as well. Like so, like if Calabro was riding the driver, and you go, "Oh, those guys are pretty good at doing this," but if it's just a vendor, like so, if a vendor just turns up and I'm going, "We have this driver half written in house, and we want to upstream it," the default answer is always no, because they will just go away, and you will never see them again. But if they're going, "Well, we contract a Calabro to finish this," and you, Daniel tells me that that they're, and it's like, then yeah, we'll probably merge it at that point and let them do incremental in tree development. But yeah, it's that. It's again. Every case is unique, and you have to negotiate every case on its merits. I have a view of who I can trust today, so that's yeah. yeah. And like we've we've done ones where we we started upstreaming some some drivers, and then the funding ran out, but we kept on doing it, paying for it ourselves because our name was attached to it, and there's some level of embarrassment. So like, you know, that's the cost of having that reputation, right? But. Um, there's also, you know, we've been paid to, we've been paid by people who have bought a bunch of boards and they don't quite do the thing that they want. So they'll pay us to implement some kind of feature. And, you know, great, that works, we get the feature upstream, but what tends to happen is the, when they want to do their next generation, they turn around to the vendor and they say, well, that all sounds really great, but last time I bought your hardware, I ended up having to spend 80 grand to make it work and don't do that this time. Like, you know, you don't have to just deal with the vendor directly. Like by the time you're into to OEM and to, to product land, you can use them to apply pressure back to the original manufacturers and do that kind of pincer movement. Would you consider dropping a driver that has been merged on the basis of trust if the vendor then doesn't move forward? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it causes regression issues with Linus, and that's always uh, a discussion that's not fun. So uh, I, I would probably... You, you, you could drop support in Mesa and not the kernel. Yeah, we could, we, we, we could put it into a Mesa, stop releasing it, or, yeah, or we would stop just touching it and leave it alone, and it would never get updated, and you know, it would just break naturally, because stuff just breaks naturally when you stop looking at it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever... Have we ever faced that? I've come close, that's true. But I don't think I've ever had to pull the actual, yeah, I'm kicking you out of the kernel level trigger. It's, it's a pretty extreme. As someone who's been kind of on multiple sides of this now, like working at Intel on the graphics stack and now at Google pushing Chrome OS and having to support these things, um, I can definitely say that it's, it's kind of incremental. And you, and you do want to be careful, like Dave said, to try and build the community and think about who the real customer is, right? So on the one hand, you can kind of saber rattle a little bit with the, with the vendors and say, hey, can you level up your contribution? Can you improve this? Can you document that before you let it in? But if you make that um, like the initial bar, like Dave said, uh, you may end up just getting no contributions. And, on, and to the point about dropping stuff, yeah, you could threaten to drop it, but really, who are you hurting there? You're hurting the, the end users. You're hurting the people who, are, who have this deployed. The vendor doesn't care, obviously, at that point if they've abandoned it. And so the question is, well, yeah, what do you do? Do you have someone step up and volunteer? You, you know, um, but anyway, that, there's, there's all these balance, all these uh, interests to balance, right? Customers, the developers on the upstream side, the vendors, and, uh, and the needs of everybody. So it's, it's just inherently challenging, but I think, to Dave's point, the incremental approaches uh, can really work. We don't need everything at the start, right? You can start with something that's better than now. In the camera case, now nothing is upstream, right? So for a lot of these cameras, so. Well, I, okay, so I'm just Nothing is extreme like, for the IPU6. So, so, uh, I, <laughs> so, so, but, but no, no, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> have the ISP. Okay. Don't rattle on that, don't rattle on that. I'm just saying like the, the state of cameras we know for say Qualcomm or MediaTek is not great, right? And so if we say, hey, everything has to be 100% document open source, we're not gonna get anything, right? If we say, hey, get a baseline of features up, that's gonna be better than where we are today. And then today's point, we keep ratcheting up. Yeah, don't worry about like, whether everything is 100% or 99.9. And, and, and companies are here for the long term, right? For the long time. You don't want, if somebody, if, if a company misbehaves, your level of threat is going to diminish to the, to the next driver they're going to land. And at the end of the day, it's a driver by driver decision. And part of your decision plan is how do you trust this company? How do you trust this entity that is providing you the driver?
Yeah, but I think we have very good examples of companies that have been behaving extremely well. Absolutely, and they supported upstream in the kernel, in the camera. There's, there's, yep. I can give you an example <laughs> that is not. But that company hasn't behaved well. Hmm? That company I, I hasn't behaved well. I think they have been, well. I mean, I think have been behaving well. But uh, that's, again, that's something we can discuss. But there are lots of users in the internet who are unhappy there and who definitely disagree with you. Yeah, and I mean, we they... have high-profile kernel maintainers who said, well, if you don't agree with that, stop buying Intel chips. I was just saying that five years ago, it was probably, as you said, camera, there is nothing upstream. And that's really not true, because we are seeing most, more and more contribution and upstream being supported there, something that maybe five years ago was not imaginable. And it's right, the big names are not there, uh, but we, we didn't have the, the small names ne neither five years ago. Yeah, and we and, never and we asked 100% working... of documentation. This was never a requirement. What we really want is to have a camera that works decently. I mean, just like my camera, my notebook, it should, if I am in front of, of the camera, it should be seen at this display. And just like that. We need just the basics. Yes, and that is still a problem because most of the vendors don't allow that because you need to balance uh, white, uh, white balance. You need to do some tricks, otherwise the hardware doesn't really produce, or the image is too noisy for even to you to recognize the people. Uh, I, so or are you leaving out a really big part of the market there? I mean, lots of the discussion here today is focusing on users having cameras in laptops or tablets and who can't use that for video conferencing today. That's an important use case. Yeah, yeah, but you're yeah. leaving out all the industrial, the, all the IoT, all the edge use cases. And that's a very different case. In, in there, you, you have very different business constraints and the requirements. So you, when you say, yes, I yes. want a camera that has a decent image quality, on the IoT use cases, that's not what they want. Of course, they want the decent image quality, but they need the, the, the ability to tweak way more things than a user on, on a laptop. So we have to look at the big picture as well to be able to set the bar correctly. But you decide, I mean... Yeah, but in, even in this... so, we are not requiring 100% of documentation. We, we, we do want not have a closed source there. That's, that's the actual requirement. I think the requirement today is that we... I mean, and, and, and I think that is written somewhere in some meetings we had ago is that we don't want vendor pass-through. And this is written in stone. We, 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 we wrote this th uh, two years ago yeah, from one of the media summits when we were talking about KCAM. So it's not fair saying that this is a model that we support. And saying that we only, they only want uh, minimum camera support, that's not true. I mean, Logan is, is, is pushing for full open documentation. So... It's not really Yeah. It's not really full documentation. The requirement that you are mentioning has been written, I think, was the last media summit. It's either an open source implementation in LibCamera or any other framework, documentation of parameters, but those two are not, we don't want both of them. Yeah. And if we had them, if we had them no. nobody would push them away, but I mean, but that's not a requirement. You cannot use any extra feature that is not documented. That, that's the vice pass through, and DRM would allow something different would allow accept blobs with the documented parameters in that case. Yes. We would accept whatever Laurent is accepting in KCAM, and then if somebody else writes a separate thing that's nothing to do with LibCamera and happens to use that API, well, we're not going to be able to stop that. But, there is a, there, yeah, but we're not going to put an, a, a kernel driver in just for that. And you know, we've been doing this with like, I don't think I've, I don't think anyone really has gotten a kernel driver in without having a really at least in the 3D level. I, I, the Excel is a bit more sketchy, but you know we're trying to build that. Um, yeah, they, they generally end up using their open source thing more often than their closed source thing if they end up building one. It, it, the market just makes it happen. They just the, the effort of having to get your people to put this other piece of source that they can't get out of can't lip camera and build it all. It just it, it, it's too much for people. And, and then you know people have oh we want to see the source and it, it, yeah I think eventually yes it will happen. Someone will build another thing on top of the DRM or V4L2 API or bypass but. That that shouldn't be your concern. Your concern is how do I engage all of them, as many users as possible? Lib camera, get the other ISPs, you know, get get as many as broad a support as possible in the market. Try and bring up the level, 
And then, yeah, there's always going to be people that will try and game it and abuse it. And you have to spot those people as quickly as possible and, you know, don't put their drivers in the kernel or... If I think of uh, what has the discussion, uh, discussion that, that, that has taken place for the past half an hour, 45 minutes, if I, if I think of uh, working that way uh, it, it when, when it comes to cameras, uh, there are a couple of issues. So if you're reviewing your driver, uh, you can't say what kind of image quality is going to give, give you. You obviously need the, the entire stack. Uh, software stack to, to be able to judge that. And it is also very difficult to objectively uh, uh, measure that. I guess, I guess some, some, something exists today, but it's not something that we are, we are using at all. So, and, and, and what it would, would uh, take to, 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 to have that kind of a setup that uh, we could objectively measure what, what these de devices are, are doing. It's, like you, it's you, a, you're getting into the area of what we call conformance testing, is what we, yeah. what we have but, in, but, in our but, area. And but that's but a hard continue, problem. If I may continue. So if, I, if you have an IO control based API that clearly defines the APIs that are, that are supported, that's, uh, that's, that's something that we can clearly say that what is, in, what is there and what is not. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter when, whether ISP uh, features are all, all, also, all supported, uh, what, what the, what the requirement has been basically in the past that uh, what, is, uh, what is supported is also documented. But if you have a common buffer, that's ba that basically disappears. I, I, I don't think, but what, the, do you count a C implementation or something as documented? It's like, is there enough explanation in the C code, the open source code, to say that's documenting these features and then there's a few zeros that you just don't ever know what to program? Like, there's always registers you don't know what to do with. There's always must be zeros. There's always things, chicken bits and stuff that are hidden from everyone and they're, they're on every hardware. And occasionally someone will go off crazy and start putting values into those parameters and see what happens. And maybe they'll work it out, maybe they won't. And maybe there are things that, experimental features that the ISP doesn't want to support. That's, you can't, yeah, you, you, I don't think you're going to get documentation, you know, that, I, I, get, I think having a C implementation in this case is probably more valuable than a documentation. So actually that the, the, the software imp implementation is mainly for the data flow, okay, the data flow between the software firmware and the hardware. And you can have a unified software implementation, but feed into or inputs to a different tuning file, you will get a different IQ quality. Right, so I don't think that IQ versus the software they are associate, they should be separate. The image quality depends on obviously the hardware. It's a given, but that's set in stone. It depends on the tuning process, and then it depends on all your code in user space that takes the tuning parameter and will compute dynamically at runtime the SP parameters. You have those three components. Um, and if we set standards for the image quality, I mean, you compare that to conformance testing. Uh, conformance testing is something that's well understood, but cheap to do. Running benchmarks, that's fine as well. But if you want to run IQ test, real professional quality IQ test, you're talking about having an imaging lab that has a cost of more than 100,000 euros, right? So we need a different You need game. to find something smaller then. You need to find an acceptable level that's not that. But Because the other option is you have a group of people who you trust and you send them the hardware and the complete device and you look at it and go, this is good enough. No, no, you can't, you can't do that with a human. No, so you're going to have to figure out some way of saying that this is good enough. It's the only, you ha that's on you, I can't tell you what that no, is. We'll, 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 we'll have to find a way, but my point is that it's a different game than for GPUs. Yes. Oh, that, that's that problem has been solved already. I mean, we, OEMs do this every day. That's how they choose one solution or, or the other. Do you have uh, quality reports? you define how the image should look with this specific amount of light. And those specifications exist. We just need to follow one. And they are objective and subjective. They are both. You, we, in Chrome OS, we use third parties to validate that a camera quality is good enough. We, just, we can use the same. And we can. How, how we much can, do you pay those third parties? Those hmm? third part, how much do you pay those third parties have, to validate that? Have, that's, that's a question for. for yeah, but I mean, I mean, the community can't do that. No, but you don't have to do it. You trust a third party and you say, that the vendor needs to provide you a, a certified that this, this vendor is conforming to this quality. And they will do it because they, will land, they want to land the code. And they will tell you that this, according to this specification, is good enough for that specification. Yeah, like if you define a process or an, a, a, an agreement that you're something that, that's 
like I said, it's something that they have to go through and say at the end of it that this is passed by those people and you trust those people. You don't need to do it yourself then. You just let the company do that and give you the result. And then you say, okay, this, the, the, this is valid. And the reporters in com the report you know, you, again, no, you, You'd probably, that may be even too far. You may not even need to go that far. But again, you have to def figure out what's the most appropriate thing in your industry that will cover that. You can have different rules based on the market. Uh, a, a quick question, just from my understanding. Uh, measuring image quality that depends hugely on your lenses and sensors and whatever. So, how, what, what do you, uh, when it comes to upstreaming an ISP, the, the, the chosen sensor and lens is not included in that. So, what sort of test would you do there? What would you use in order to determine that the ISP can reach good enough image quality? You're absolutely correct. It's, it's always the combination of ISP, sensor, and lenses. And, it, and that's a very good question, and that's why I'm saying that this is a bit of a different game than GPUs when it comes to testing. And we will have to decide on that, but it's more complicated, not just a, about running a conformance suite or a benchmark. I, I don't leeway. think that this is actually a problem. I mean, uh, if you go to any uh, the, of those uh, certified uh, testing and stuff, they have their own hardware, so they eventually may have a, one uh, specific sensor with one specific lens and use this for all different vendors. That would be one option. Uh, another option would be to have different profiles. So this is level A, level B, and we, we, we may have things like that. I don't think this is the problem. I, I mean, the idea of having a process like that works. Uh, I'm just not sure how to implement this in practice. I mean. We, as an open source community, how can we require those kind of things? Uh, just on the topic of the image quality, can't you just cut out the sensor and uh, like replace it with like uh, some sensors uh, have like static images that you can configure them through I square C, right? Or like just uh, if it's MIPI sensor, generate the MIPI stream and like have some standard that you will like pass to the ISP, then you control the input and uh, you stream the output of the ISP and that way like you can uh, validate like how good yeah, it is. But the real problem is not if you stack image, images. The real problem is when you change the lightings and you, you change the backgrounds, you have a close or a more distance uh, camera. So all of those affect the algorithm. So it's not, it's not an easy test like that. But of course, a library, uh, a, a lab, a proper lab, a library, could, uh, lab, sorry, proper lab could be doing those kind of tests, but then someone needs to write some uh, specification about that. And someone needs to enforce this kind of things. And I don't think we developers should do that. And yeah, but there's uh, the calibration files, they are usually always always agnostic. So if there's a product in Windows supporting that combination of sensor lens, you just take it. Yes. Uh, so I'm si slightly confused because we're talking about mem to mem ISPs, right? Yes. So you're feeding the images to it. Yes. So why would the sensor matter? Um, you have your set of conformance test images and that has to pass. It's a real-time process, right? So, for instance, if you think about the auto exposure, making sure that you get a properly exposed image, not overexposed or underexposed, that's going to configure the exposure time, the no, configure I'm the gain, and the sensor. Even if it's a real-time thing, you're still passing it, capturing first, then feeding it through memory to the ISP. You control all the inputs. You just have a sequence for it. It's a feedback. It's a it's a feedback loop. Uh huh. Right? Oh, so, so you're saying that. Once the parameters are configured, then the input needs to change. Is that? So the, 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 the way it works is that you're going to calculate parameters for the ISP based on information you got from the previous frames. They're going to be applied to the next frame, and you're going to keep doing that process. Uh, if you think about, as I said, auto exposure or autofocus, if you want to make sure that the autofocus implementation works correctly, well, clearly, you have to have a sensor with a lens that you can move, a focus okay, lens that you can it. move. Okay, I get it. So 
It has to feed back to an actual thing. It and has to feed can, back to actual hardware. You can't emulate hardware. it. Okay. And then you, it's very difficult to run two runs of the algorithms, like changing something and see the impact, because the world changes. It's the mechanical world, the physical world, will not react the same way twice. Um, uh, unless you record, m unless you have videos that are changing oh, light and changing yeah. uh, the focus. So what, you, what you can do. I have to yeah. say <laughs> that uh, it's very hard for the yeah, eyeball. You, you verify the IQ quality. Okay. So just to share something that uh, for uh, you know very professional testing that uh, we have, that uh, actually we compare the actual output versus the you know algo simulator output, which should be reached a bit by bit, right? And uh, this is the one only can be done by the ISP vendors. I don't think we need to propagate to uh, you know open source. This will be a duplicate effort because uh, the one we upstream those code, we guarantee this is matched. When, when you say it's us ISP vendors doing that, I agree that that works for a specific use case, but again, we are not looking at other people using your ISPs in their product and giving them the possibility to do their tuning for their specific use case, which might be very different than the one that you have been tuned for. And with all the discussion, it seems to me that we are trading uh, one open source tuned implementation for a very specific use case with maybe also configuration parameters for a very specific use case certified by the vendor with the possibility of giving third parties full access to control of the ISP for doing tuning at the same level for their use case. And that it cuts out a lot of middle size or third parties from having this possibility. I'm not sure if that's desirable, that's it. I'm saying that we should, look, we should first solve the problem for most of the users, and then the market will automatically solve for the other ones. Most of the Chromebook users or most of the users? No, most of the users. Number of users, souls, number of souls. How, what, is, what is more important today? Are there more camera sensors integrated in IoT and embedded devices or in Chromebooks? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in mobile phones or in IoT? I'm pretty sure it's mobile phones. And this is yeah, what we are talking about. No, we're not talking about mobile I'm phones. I'm talking mobile phones. No, no, yes. nobody in this room is talking about mobile phones. Everybody's talking about mobile phones. No. Everybody's talking about complex cameras, which is basically using the ISPs that, we, that are in place in mobile phones into other markets. No, there are a lot of use cases. There are a lot of embedded and IoT use cases which are complex in the scene. It's complex in different way, but <laughs> it's complex as in the mobile phone or tablet or Chromebook, whatever call it, use case, personal device use cases. And those are, again, I don't want to, to stress that out too many times, but it's more accomplished with very specific use case that maybe we are leaving, cutting off from the market completely because they won't have no, access to the tuning no. parameters of a specific block of the ISP because that block has not been either documented or they, even exposed or described by the vendor. They have they have the free choice to buy another ISP. Yeah, and, and it's like if if the vendor's not talking to them now, they're not going to get anything now anyway. They're already cut off. There's no, you're not helping them. You know, you, all you're doing is giving them a longer delay because the vendors aren't willing to do this. So if you give them the open source driver that exposes a number of chunks, there may still be bits we can't see, but then that you have to let them go to somewhere else or find a friendly ISP vendor. You can't you can't save them all. There's just not this doesn't scale like that. We need you need to find the point where there's an inflection point that will cause things to move sufficiently that that pressure from those people will matter because it will be a from the ISP's point of view it won't be I have to release 100% of my stuff. It'll be an extra 5% or like you know we work with Nvidia. It's like how does this work in your GPU? We're not telling you, and then. Well, t you know, you come back and go, well, could you tell us this a little bit? And they'll give you that. And then in a year later, they'll give you the thing you asked for in the first place. But it's like, you, you need to build a community of those people to say, this is something we need. They need to get that requirement into your camera and push I, it back I down. think you're already building the community. Yeah. And that, that was my point. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Raspberry Pi, the work your guy is doing, um, can you tune those? Is that open? 
So there is a possibility for, if you are an industrial designer, you want to have special use cases, then the Raspberry Pi, hey, that might be a good choice. So if, say, uh, another vendor who doesn't have that, so it would go into lip camera and it would be, say, uh, it would be optimized for laptop use, okay? It wouldn't be able to do that. So then you have to advise someone, oh, I want to use it for a specific application, and then you can say, okay, yeah, you can't use that. But hey, the Raspberry Pi, hey, those guys are great. And that would push uh, pressure on that other vendor, hopefully in the long term, that won't happen overnight, to perhaps also allow that. But it, it, it would be a different problem if nobody would have it. But there is at least already one that can do this. You can't force a company that isn't willing to play with you to play with you. If they're not willing to talk to you, then no amount of pressure you put on them will work. I, I would also, in the same line of, as Hans, for me, if, at, I mean, we have already one good example, which is Raspberry Pi 5, but if, for the other vendors, if they have something that works fine on my laptop and on my cell phone, I'm pretty happy with that. I mean, we can go further then after this is uh, already standard, but it could be done later, in my opinion. So first of all, I don't think Raspberry Pi is a good example here, because if you're building a, I mean, would Cisco put a Raspberry Pi in their product? You, you, you complained before that, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you've complained before with that using some vendors who I won't name, and you're dealing with their closed source camera stack and it's painful. So now we have competition in the market. Would you replace that vendor with Raspberry Pi? It's would be an interesting idea, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to my boss. But uh, what uh, I'm saying here is that in a perfect market solution, where you have lots of competitions, some are open and some are closed, I would agree that that would be easier to do. That, but we're that, not at that point now. That, that particular vendor has way more problems. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you can, a big problem today is, that's just true, uh, lots of laptops have these Intel chips and you don't have a webcam. Fix that. And we want that to have tune. So you already make a lot of users very happy. And then the next step will definitely be, okay, can we improve this further? Can we, so I like that idea of just ratcheting up. But you, you, you can't just post, you can't just post, almost there. You can't just postpone getting it in until, okay. You mentioned Raspberry Pi is a good example of that. But Raspberry Pi, they, they did an amazing job, but they, they've not been the only ones. We have more vendors that are doing the same, and if we place ourselves five years ago, and if we five years ago would have said, okay, let's give all, the, all of them a free card for, keep, for doing pass-through, we would not be here today pleasing, uh, be happy about Raspberry Pi or uh, Mali or... Uh, RKSP1 is well supported, Mayline, ISP, I, IMX8 and Plus from NXP supported, Mayline. We got there because five years ago we decided not to do pass through. But that's not a valid argument. Nobody can predict the future. The same argument can see, could be that if five years ago we went for a different model, now maybe we had five times more vendors. So that's not a valid argument. No, we no, cannot, no, no, we no, 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 I disagree there. We, 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 have fi we have five of experience there engaging with the market. No, we are growing the numbers of vendors who are supported. So we have actual data points that show that what we're doing is working to some extent. And you, you propose replacing that with something that's based on no data point. Based on DRM data points. You can use their experience. And based on their experience, they're doing an amazing job and engaging with vendors and providing drivers to users. Because at the end of the day, what we should care is about users. That's the only thing we should be caring about. We should provide, our Linux should be useful to users. Well, first of all, we're talking about GPUs and cameras, and that's not the same thing. This it's the same model. It's the same, the same, peop, it's the same people are making GPUs, are making, uh, are making ISPs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think uh, the, the, the key thing is that for open source, we need to allow or support our different business models. The Recipe Pi business model will be different to the model to Intel or the other companies, I believe, right? 
and you, we cannot force uh, one more uh, other company to using a same business model. That's the key. Then Actually, that from the open source wing to support all different kinds of the business models. That's the spirit of the open source, right? There might be business models, but I think it's more important the internal culture at each company. And, 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 and as well a power place between different groups within each company. And we cannot see that. But I think that's probably the single most important thing which uh, uh, tells us if a company is going to work with us or not. We just don't know. But it's very cool because uh, when more and more companies start playing in such a way compatible with uh, mainline, then we see that some arguments that people are uh, the, 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 the debating internally at each company, they might not be valid, which is, again, patents and, uh, and uh, competitive uh, advantage. And the people who are fighting those battles in, in, within each company, they may have more ammo if there are some companies which have been able to make business, gain customers by playing well with the community. So it's not just about market pressure. It's as well about changing minds within each company and community. Yes, I fully agree with that. And, that, and that's something we've, we're seeing happening in quite a few companies we, uh, we've been engaging with. And going back to what uh, Chen Yu said, I agree with you that we can't force people to do what they don't want to do. But with the rules that we have set today, uh, with ISP support in the kernel and what we're doing in LibCamera, there are people we have approached a few years ago who said, no, we're never going to do that, and today they are changing their mind. So what we're doing today is working. And it's not working with 100% of the SP vendors yet, uh, because you can't address the whole market in one go. But I have good data to show that it's actually working and it's expanding. Why don't, why don't we let the vendor choose? They, if, if you are offering them a value, they will choose that solution. There, there needs to be a win for, I mean, vendor, if they use your solution, they are going to have more market. They will, they will use your solution. Let we, we, we're letting vendor choose. I mean, on the IPU6 case, for instance, mm -hmm. we haven't had a driver for the ISP for use. People are complaining about that. And Intel could have chosen to open a driver and document what they have. They have chosen not to, no. so they have chosen to impede the users. We have chosen to ignore millions of users because they are... No, yes, yes, Intel that's has decided no, that's to let true. down the users. No, no. Intel yeah. has decided to let down the users. I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. No, I don't that, agree with that. that that's argument, it, it's really hurting. It, it has been used many times, saying that we are hurting users because sure. we, companies that refuse to cooperate in a way and, and decide to release binaries, as the IPU6 fiasco has been, they're hurting users, not, the, not us. That's unfair to say, in my opinion. Uh, what? <laughs> let me put something. Uh, the I, real I, I thing can here. Say, I can, sorry. Just ahead. a second. Just a second. Yeah. Uh, the real point here is that what I'm seeing here is that we are, uh, as video for Linux uh, community, not the API, nothing related to any technical issues. Uh, it is all about those non-technical ones. We, as a video for Linux community, we really want something that works and that is open source. And vendors have been pushing for a long time, since uh, maybe just after N900, all the other uh, attempts of uh, adding ISP were at the line of closed source. And we've been attempting up to now with success, we are blocking those things. So right now what I'm seeing is that people are trying to diverge using a DRM as a escape route. I, I mean, we sh as a community should not allow this. It doesn't matter for me if this is implemented via video for Linux or via DRM or via whatever other subsystem. But we really want to have open source drivers that work in the center way. And, it may not be the perfect world, but it should at least provide something that has enough quality for the ones that will be using the cameras. And that's what we are discussing now. Now we are discussing if we should drop the requirement of having everything open that goes from user space to, to, uh, to the hardware. Nobody has ever discussed allowing drivers that are useless. Everybody, everybody wants a camera that is useful 
That's what everybody wants. Is the level of quality that you expect the open source implementation to provide, is that something that will be good enough for Chrome OS? Yeah. So can you commit today that Chrome OS will ship only open source code for camera support no, on IPv6? I, I cannot commit to that. I mean, I'm in that position to commit is to anything. Is it good enough or is it not good enough? It has to be good enough. I mean, that's what I will be pushing for. So, but if, I promise so you, if it's good enough, why would you use the closed source? I mean, we can, we can call Sundar, and he will tell what he did with this. But what I can tell you is that in all my power and will, I will try to push for that. And I've been doing this for many years. So there's no reason to, to believe that I won't be doing that. Yeah, but I don't, be, I don't believe it's going to happen. OK, so it's open driver, open user space, fully open stack. That's what you would ship? I would rather ship an open stack. Driver, I agree. We, I, oh, it, it, so given the choice between like some, and we've done this before, right? We do this today. We actually ship open drivers in, in lieu of closed drivers, even if they're missing features or have lower performance. <laughs> or lower quality. We do that because it's actually possible for us to support and maintain. So yes, I would drastically prefer an open driver. Now, if open isn't open and it's just a blob in user space, well, that doesn't give me any advantages. I can't support that any more easily, right? So I don't want that. I want a fully open driver. But fully open also doesn't have to mean every registered documented, every feedback loop documented, right? It's like, that's, and I think that's what we're arguing about here. Like some people buy us very far down towards everything fully open. Other people are like, hey, you know, not everything's open today. We've got firmwares running. We don't have any visibility into any way. Like that's not great, but it's better than nothing. And I think that's, that's kind of where the disagreement is here. But what I hear from this discussion is that everyone sounds like to be happy, happy with the with the uh, current uh, IPU, uh, well, or not the current, but the IPU6 uh, functional scope that would give some kind of image, image. So, so uh, whether or not uh, this would be a Vifrol2 or you know, or alternatively a DRM driver, uh, would that matter anymore? Much. I mean, okay, if, as if, far you, as if, you, if the user space w w API would would have the scope that is only that would only be supported by the partial hardware support. So, so there would be no API to access all the features of the hardware. I was a ABI, not a API. ABI. ABI. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. You're yeah. saying if, if there was a so if there was so a if we if we limit limit the uh, let's say that we would have open source uh, stack full open source stack support for IPv6 that limits the, the, the hardware features to, to those that would be only used by the, implemented by, the, by the, that, that stack. And the UAPI would not allow to use the rest. Um, would everyone be happy with that? So you're asking if you shipped a driver that just implemented the features that we need, would we care if it didn't implement features we don't? I think that definitionally, no, we don't care about the ones that we don't, and so that would be fine. Right. Uh, it's, not, yeah. it's not ideal, it's not great, because it doesn't expose the full functionality of the hardware, but you know, from a use case perspective, we're just about video conferencing, basically. We don't care about world camera quality that much, so if it's a little bit limited, I think that's fine. We'd rather have an open driver that we can maintain better. Right? Um, and as for, the, as for the API question, I know that's a different question. V4L, in my opinion, is is really big. It's really highly featureful for like uh, you know boards and and tightly integrated stacks. But it's also, I don't think, ideal for a lot of the desktop SOCs that we see, where you know discrete IP blocks like video encode and decode or camera ISPs or whatever can be represented with much more small and targeted APIs. But that's just a a broader discussion. <laughs> Just to make my position clear when it comes to video for Linux against DRM, if, it's, if, if the openness requirements are the same, I'm going to judge that based on technical merit. So as was written on a previous slide or further, I don't remember, I'm not going to block that on principle just because it's DRM and not video for Linux. I'm totally fine having, including in camera support for uh, DRM-based drivers, 
as long as that matches all the rest of the requirements. So that, that, part, is, uh, that part is fine. And regardless of whether this particular driver or other drivers will use DRM and video for Linux in the future, we did identify a few shortcomings and things that are already being worked on in video for Linux, improvements that would benefit ISPs but also benefit codecs, uh, and those are things that will be done anyway, regardless of whether we do it for ISPs or not. Yeah. The discussion is basically vendor pass-through, if this is something we want to accept or not. And I think we, can, we have seen some experience from DRM. We have been having our approach for, for years. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, and the thing is, like, yeah, get the v, I don't think the V4L2 versus DRM thing really matters. Uh, like, I would not accept a DRM driver without Laurent or someone in the camera community telling me that they wanted this driver in DRM. I'm not like going to go, Intel sent this to me, of course I'm going to merge it. Like, that's not, your community is your community and I don't have enough insight to know that. All I have is, you told me you wanted this, I'm happy to put it in there. And you, you will end up being the maintainer of the camera section of my DRM bits, because I, I don't have that level of insight. But, and I don't probably have space to fit that in my brain. But yeah, it, and I, so again, if they define, I, if the API they end up giving in DRM fills all of the lib cameras requirements, and but it's still quite identifiable as a as a vendor pass through. You can you can try and try and push back and say, well, maybe we should limit the kernel driver to only accepting certain things, and that's fine as well. That's another negotiation of when you develop because. Vendor pass through should not be the goal of any person writing a kernel driver. If that's a side effect, that kind of work, it, it's impossible to avoid. Yeah, that's, but it's again, everyone is an individual negotiation. There's no rule. The minute you set a rule saying no vendor pass through, they're going to call it something else. They'll just make it a multiplexer, ioctal, magic thing that stuff goes through. It, you know, whenever you have an API that exposes a, 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 an entry point, Someone can always write another API on top of it that puts all of our entry points through that single API. So it's like you're just you're just moving the game up. And that's, not pro that's not possible in video for Linux today because we are passing regist we are we are passing concepts. We are not passing. Yeah. Well, we are, but, but, we but you're suffering from the fact that that doesn't scale in the performances and the, so yeah to get to the point where you have a driver that is what you know, solves the problems you're having and fits the hardware model. You are going to have to accept that the that you vendor pasture is going to be a negotiation. You you just go. It's obviously what you're doing here. We can see it. We're going to stop that from happening. You know, but it's going to be every uh, trust problem. I, I like how you, how you phrase that. Vendor pass through should be a side effect under the goal. Uh, <laughs> to to revert the question, so video for Linux versus DRM. Uh, I explained my position on that. So if we have a particular ISP driver, uh, if that driver can be implemented with the same level of effort in the same level of performance in video for Linux and DRM, would you still say it should be done in DRM, or would you say no, that video for Linux is a good thing? I think it's like, if you find yourself in the kernel writing floating point calculations, you're probably in the wrong place. If you find yourself in the kernel needing doubles, unless you're AMD's graphics driver, you're probably in the wrong place. Generally, if there's a complex set of calculations that need to get you from what the API wants to what the hardware wants, and it's a bunch of floating point calculations or a bunch of table lookups or a bunch of, that should be in user space. And it's the same thing for the, video decode engines. And there's, that. there's no disagreement about that. I mean, that's not a question. Video for Linux or DRM, that's going to be in user space anyway. But then, yeah. but, but then if that's all in user space, I don't, I, yeah, I, if the other problem is, there's, it's 10 ioctals to get to the thing, and there's no nice fencing. You need fencing, or you know, those things are already there in DRM, so maybe it makes sense. And it's like if you can bring the V4L API up to the point where that it implements the same thing as DRM, then you don't need a DRM driver. You know, okay. I, 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 I'm not. Again, if someone does want a DRM, we have to decide it was a bad idea in two years, and we stick it in the other one. And that goes back, I think, to the, I don't know if you, yeah, to exactly that slide. Uh, if we can't fix the problems in video for Linux that actually hinder the drivers in a reasonable time, then we're not going to block a DRM drivers in principle, on, on, on principle. If those problems are fixed, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I, I would block a DRM driver on principle, but if a vendor tells me I could do that with video for Linux and there would actually be no drawback, tell them, well, why do you do it in DRM in that case?
I, but I think it's definitely a, should be a reflection of the hardware programming model, and yes. that's what yes. draws that line. And and, and I, I, as I said, I think in state stateless stateful decoders, you already went the wrong way with that. I think a lot of stuff that happens in stateless decoders should be in user space and should not be in the kernel. And I don't want you to say that mistake that. again. I, I, yeah. I can't answer yeah, that yeah, yeah, just in terms of like you shouldn't be parsing H two six four headers in the kernel. You shouldn't be parsing that sort of stuff calculating in the kernel because the, the stateless decoders don't. Uh, right? Some of them do. That's not in user space, right? I think some of it. Short answer is I don't know the details. I have to double check. Yeah, but, but there, is, there is some looking into headers. But if you're, if you're parsing untrustable co stuff or parsing things that are, you know, you, you don't want to be arbitrary calculations. And But it, if you can get V4L2 to have a model that I think the other thing that helps to not is like if I have to implement a whole lot of pointless boilerplate in my driver to satisfy a whole lot of requirements of the of the subsystem that aren't necessary. No. Now, like that's sort of if I have to do a whole lot of stuff with like I don't know enough about this, but like say like I have a whole lot of format handling that's just required because that's part of the way V4L2 works. But my doesn't fit my model because that's all done in user space. Why you know that making that simpler? And ioctals? Do I need ioctals for every single thing, or is there some way we can like IOU ring style? That's one thing. Like you know, do you build command buffer type things? And you you know, th that's a bit of work. And it may that it may be just better to build that again in DRM on top of what we have. But it may be better to do it. In I don't know. Uh, video for links actually supports uh, meta the data on buffers that could be used for pass through, even if we don't want, so vendor can still be using this kind of things. So there, everything that uh, is needed, at least but the basic function are already there. Maybe, I mean, we don't have fences, maybe we don't have uh, some specific things, but I guess in terms of functionality, we have most, if not all, the things that are needed for uh, ASP support. For, for oh, of course, there are, we, someone will need to write things, try to port a driver. Uh, if they are missing features, we will be adding. But there's not, nothing really blocking, I think. When it comes to formats in Wiffrel 2 and, and you're supporting ISPs, the, the information on what the format is used for those buffers, it's needed by the different processing and, and act, acting on them. So, so that that is provided by the Vifrel2 API, so, and I think that it's a good, good thing that it's standardized. So when it comes to the formats, the reason we keep that as an explicit API, which makes it more difficult indeed, um, is that for all the hardware generations that do not have IMMUs, for instance, you need to validate the format against the buffer size. That has to be done in the kernel, so the kernel needs to know what the format is and needs to make sure it will either write the registers corresponding to the format manually or patch the command buffer with that information itself. But that's the only reason. Uh, everything else of the ISP, uh, we don't do that through explicit consent with v 2 API. It comes from a buffer that's contracted from user space. Again, yeah. Uh, may, maybe just uh, on the stateless decoder part that, that we talked about, um, most of the parameters that we have, we actually just pass through, like basically the user space calculates it, we pass it through uh, controls, and we basically just set the registers directly with small diversions. Um, like, I, I don't have all the drivers currently now in my headspace, but I think for the most case, like we do um, stuff like, maybe we convert a scaling list a bit, before setting it to the registers, but otherwise most things are passed through. Yeah, I guess there's one driver that actually formats on an H, uh, A262, I guess. It's an old driver, so it has an MPEG thing there, a header there, but just because that driver was a very uh, old um, device, a very old camera device. And we do have a few things done in Carol, but for Vivid Driver, if I'm not mistaken, in order to test. But just that, we normal drivers uh, is all under the space, as, I, as far as I know. So I have a query in the DRM. Whatever the lookup tables prepared in the user space, right? So those will be sent as commands to the kernel. That will send to the hard hardware. Right. The, is there any validation happens, uh, the generation of the lookup tables in the user space or kernel space? What content they're 
filling the in the memory you know my query is uh, whatever the lookup tables uh, registers prepared by the user space yeah. the most complex logic in the user space is that validated and exactly is there a validation what exactly those lookup table content is um or it's a pass through I, I, it depends on the, the the hardware i suppose it depends on if there's if it's if, if you're just passing a bunch of values into the firmware and the firmware is going to validate there's no need for the kernel to get involved it should just pass it through if, if there's but if there's like generally the, the only job the kernel has in these situations is to make sure you don't screw up the rest of the system and that's like address validation you don't go using pages that aren't yours you don't go you know and if it's just a set of parameters that this makes no sense to the kernel and it has to go to the, the firm so pass through to rest yeah, of it. those things go straight but yeah but you would be generating them in user space and so you should know what they are and what they mean enough that you know generate so that you user space whatever it generates right? are those documented or based on the hardware just it's a blob for most of like for GPUs, it's just blobs. Like we don't, we don't, we, but we have virtual memory sp uh, things and stuff. We, you know, we don't. We used to have to validate each command and know exactly what was in all of them. We we still do know what's in them, but we generally don't have to validate it anymore. But but mo it sounds like for most of these parameters, it's not like containing a bunch of addresses or a bunch. Like we have, we often have problems where we've got descriptor tables, as Daniel said earlier. And some of the descriptor tables have pointers to some of the other descriptor tables, and those pointers are addresses stuck in the middle of these blobs of data, and you have to know where those are so you can say that these are not going to cause like memory faults and stuff. But it sounds like that's not really a concern in this case, that, no, that, that the, the parameters are just numbers, and they mean something meaningful to the firmware or to the hardware. And it would be good to have those documented, but the ability to generate them in the, in the user space code is what should be open source, and that should be where you see that, not in the kernel driver. Yeah, I guess the only parameters that may happen on some source of a stream is the offset, because sometimes there is a header in, the, in, in whatever uh, frame there is. But except for that, all of them are just random numbers that you just space generates and you just pass through the driver. Actually, the algo parameter that uh, sending from the user space to the kernel space, that it's very hard for the you know, kernel driver or the firmware to verify. That's a huge number of the, its mass. So usually that uh, what we need to do or what we need to protect it is that uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, those kind of data that, uh, for example, the address, right, DMA, will not uh, impact the rest of the system. However, that uh, inside the ISP, the parameters, we will not do any verification on that. Make sure that we are on the same page. That's the same thing that happens for me for Linux drivers today. It's. And I, I think we have a, an agreement I, on this topic. I think I mean, we are running in circles. Yeah. This is pretty much what we agreed on yesterday. That like is, we want video for Linux to be better. Video for Linux, we want to have less segregation, less uh, fragmentation. But if we cannot achieve that, we are not blocking DRM. But that's fine. I think. And, and, and at the end of the day, this is a technical discussion. It should be based on technical merits. The problem is a not technical discussion. And I'm seeing here different uh, positions. So I think in, in one side, I, I think I have heard Mauro saying that he's OK with if the camera is good enough for video conferencing. And there's a chance for having a vendor IOCTLs. I see your position when you are completely against having anything which is not documented. That's not true. I okay. think so that then, could then be undocumented. Sorry. Then please but say your say your position. I mean, that's a problem. We have to agree on the level of uh, of documentation what you have and for what parts of the ISP, and that's that's a difficult part. Uh, and certainly, I want more things to be documented that you do. Um, I'm not saying that I want to reach 100 percent. As they mentioned, you may have the occasional bit of byte somewhere that has to be set to a to a value, and it's. I don't care much about that. But if you give me an ISP today and tell me, well, you're gonna, uh, only going to have uh, basic denoising uh, and not good denoising, I'm not going to be happy. But, but you're in an amazing position, because you have the keys of the castle of Leap Camera. So you can decide if that driver is shit. You can say, uh, based on case by case basis, you can say to the vendor, this is not what we want. This is enough. 
I'm not disputing that. I, so, uh, if I think we have a discussion scheduled actually for tomorrow morning to start discussing that and what would be good enough and what wouldn't. But that's a process that we, no, I mean, we're not going to have an answer on that in 10 so, minutes. But I, I just want to make sure everybody's position. So that's your position is, can you say it yourself so I don't make a mistake? What's the question? What is your position about on, on what? about vendor pastor? In my two different questions. So vendor pass through, uh, I like the way they phrase that. If it's a side effect, that could be accepted. If it's a goal, I don't like it. Uh, about the openness, that uh, that's not something that we can answer in detail in ten minutes. Uh, overall, I want to make sure that we cater for the needs of different markets and not just Chromebooks. Uh, yeah. And that means that we want to make sure that users can tune their cameras themselves. I, I have, a, I have mean, a question for you uh, about that. Okay, ju just to finish on it and then get to, the, to your question. It doesn't mean that I want vendors to, to open source the tuning tools, but I want to make it possible. So the parameters that are calculated during tuning and that need to be applied to the hardware those need to be documented somehow so that my tool that generates them. So to give you a clear example of tuning, I uh, assume that, uh, I, I hope that most people here would be familiar with the lens shading, the fact that you have this vignetting effect in the darker corners. Um, so you tune your camera, you take lots of images uh, in some environments, and you're going to calculate coefficients so that the hardware can correct that. I want to make sure that the way those coefficients are programmed in the hardware will be documented so that I can make my tool that will generate them. If you tell me that there's a tuning file that has been produced by a vendor tool and contains binary data there, and even if you tell me it's a data offset in the file, and then you just take that and pass it through, if you don't give me the ability to calculate those myself, uh, then I'm not going to be happy. What is the value for that? For uh, Chromebooks, no. Yeah, but for IPU6 devices, what is the value for that? Why do, you, why do we need to dictate where vendors have to sell their products? If they don't want to sell it... Just saying, I, I understand Laurent's point about you know, different segments. So whether you're talking about security cameras or something else, the needs are going to be different there than on a, on a clamshell device, right? And the, the driver requirements and openness requirements can be different too, right? So in the case that you're talking about, maybe the OEM is providing these tuning files as part of the device, and that's what you want to use anyway, right? But in a case where you have a more dynamic environment, you really need to be able to control that. Different devices and different drivers can have different requirements about them, right? That's also why I asked the question earlier, if it's okay to discriminate between, the, between vendors. I'm not sure if we're making today a public statement that says that Intel will never sell in the OT market. Uh, probably not. But that's also an, uh, an interesting question. Uh, how do we decide what market the vendors are interested in? Uh, but I don't think we're going to answer that now. But Hans, you had a question? I had the same question. There we go. Oh, yes. so, so personally, if, if a vendor is, say, very specific to the laptop market, then, uh, OK, personal opinion. You probably disagree, but I would be happy if the tuning would just be available for that specific market. So you have you can assure that the Chromebook market, the general laptop market, you get a good webcam. If, however, like a Raspberry Pi that is likely to be used in loads of different situations because people love to hack and use it in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways, there I want to have the full support. And the same is probably true for a lot of the embedded systems. Because we know they are used in weird and wonderful ways. But for something that is very much geared towards the PC market and for laptops and in the webcam, webcam scenario, do I want it? Well, it would be nice to have, right? Yes. But should it be a requirement? Should it something be that we really require? And as a consequence, if you decide, no, we are not going to do it, I don't know if you will, but suppose that you would say no then loads and loads of customers would be very unhappy, and they only care about uh, their webcam. So that, so it, that would be my personal opinion. I mean, looking at the market segment is something that makes sense. I'm not disputing that. Uh, and clearly, Intel is much bigger on the laptop, the tablet market segment, those segments. Uh, if you look at vendors like MediaTek or Qualcomm, are they only in the 
laptop segment or are they also in the IoT segment? I mean, that's an interesting case because that's one where, like, if you say they have to open pretty much anything, they're just going to be like, well, we'll stay downstream then, right? And so that, I think that's like Dave was talking about, the Exynos driver. I think those guys are in that category. Like, if we get something from them that, like, gives us, like, an image with an open stack, like, <laughs> we should start running with it, right? But uh, that's just my kind of view of it. Um, I, although I do know that, like, say, Qualcomm, you know, they, they're, they're moving beyond the mobile space and they recognize that the, especially, like, you know, in security space or IoT space, that people just need to be able to run with their devices without having to interact with them and their software teams. And so they're realizing, oh, wow, we better have this stuff upstream, right? And so they're, they're already facing market pressure. And so maybe we will see more openness from them in the future. And so if we see, you know, submissions from them in that context, I think it would be right to kind of say, hey, you guys are missing out on these pieces and we need to have some openness for that. Well, I think it's a, that's a very good point, uh, and uh, they, they face market pressure because they indeed uh, going for different markets. Uh, and my understanding, based on lots of discussions I've had, is that quite a few of those companies have struggles internally. They have people who are pushing for things to be more open and people who are pushing for things to be more closed. Do we want to help the people who are pushing for more open? That's, that's what I want to do. And that's what I, I want to set the bar a bit higher in that case, because that will give those people the right arguments to push internally in, to win the fight. If we say, no, no, it, because we haven't had those vendors ever with anything open, we're going to accept something that's very low, then it's going to be very hard for those people to do the right thing. And I'm not saying we have to reach 100%. But setting a bit higher and lower, I think, for these is the right, the, the, the right option. No, and if we have calibration files that are system agnostic, meaning we force the vendors, if they want to have their drivers with us, they need to be able, they need to give us a way to consume the calibration file from any system they are using. So if the device is using the IoT, I will be able to use that calibration file. If the file is, if the device is used in Windows, I will be able to take that file and consume it in Linux. Isn't that covering every single market the vendor wants to sell? That doesn't help me if I need to know how the coefficient is. That doesn't help me if I need to know how what is the coefficient, the number of digits that I, the number of uh, digital digits that I need to program mm -hmm. the coefficient with. But I need so to tune that myself. We are basically saying that we want to use that ISP with a sensor that cannot be tested and might not work at all. No, no, the, the thing is, the, U, the, the IoT OEM mm -hmm. has to be able to take a particle SOC, connect that to a sensor they choose, with a lens they choose, and handle the tuning themselves with open tools. It Why? doesn't mean that the vendor has to open their tools, but this has to be possible. And, OK, so I disagree on that one. I think uh, Hans also disagree with that one. Just correct me if, if I am putting words on your, on your mouth. Uh, can we try to find some middle ground? I, 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 think you're, yeah, I think you're falling into a, a very obvious trap here. It's called making a rule. Stop making rules. Start negotiating with the vendors individually, one-on-one, -on -one, two, two people, community and vendor. You are, you are trying to define a set of rules that will get gamed. Do not do this. You're falling into the, the rule trap. Look, I have a really... Laurent might understand this, but there's a... When graphics cards first came out, uh, people would not tell us how to program the clock to set a mode. They would give us a random table of, do you want 1024 by 768? Program four of these values in. And do you want 128? And every time a new monitor size came out, you had to go and beg them for the magic numbers. And eventually, someone went, why don't we just get the PLL algorithms and work them out? And people did. And the companies then just never stopped, never do that anymore. And it just went away. It was like, these things, will you have to just negotiate. Don't, you, you, if, if you guys can say that, look, we're going in with this level of, I want these parameters. And they can go, well, I don't think that our market segment requires us to, that, that it's going to be useful for you. You get to decide then. You, you talk to them. You, you can't make these rules and say, this is the stance we're going to go in with. You need to go in and say, what are you willing to give us? We would like to get you up to this point. Where can you go? You can't, make, you, can't, you can't publish something that you give to all these vendors and then let them go away and come back to you. You have to have a conversation with every vendor, and it takes time, and it's a pain in the ass. There's no industry rule you're going to get away with here. It's, it's lovely to think that that might be great, but it never works. And it's 
Yeah, just to try to find a middle ground here. No, it's, no, it's, no, 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 it's just no, a statement. You're falling into the no, trap. No, 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 I don't want to, I, I don't want to put a rule. I just want to, I just want to, after this discussion, it's, it's anybody here that disagree that if we have a camera with the correct openness to be defined, and an openness that satisfies sleep camera, we will allow a vendor pass through for that specific situation? Is there anybody against that statement? Not that way. As no, I said, yes. as no I, that, I, I wouldn't I, say that because you used the word vendor pass-through as a goal. It's not that's as exactly a, what I was going to say. You are, not, you are never allowing vendor pass-through. That's, that's the simple answer. You, if someone comes to you and you want vendor pass-through, your answer is no. There's no vendor pass-through ability in this. If it happens as a side effect of this process that you can happen to pa do a vendor can pass through things to their driver, that's an accidental thing and they may take advantage of that. But the rule is no vendor pass-through. You want the lib camera is the rule and the side effect, but you cannot say those words in your statement of what's acceptable. You, I would, it's, I, a, it's going in bad. I would say that, no, that, that there, is no, there is no command buffer. It's, Not, it's just basically a request to capture a frame and with, with certain parameters. So, so, so uh, I, 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 I don't think, think that the, there would be a vendor pass through as a side effect. It would be a goal rather in this case. There's a bit of a question of vocabulary. I mean, we've been talking about command buffers and parameters buffers. It's command buffers for GPUs because they execute things. It's parameters buffers for ISPs because it configures the harder a fixed pipeline to do things. But that's, yeah, I don't think the vocabulary matters too much in this case. Yeah, so, so I think uh, maybe it would make things clearer if we agree on why we want more openness or less, because I don't think anybody said what the goal is. And I think it, it ties with this thing about not having rules, uh, trying to understand the, the, the other party, uh, because um, uh, if, if we really know why for us it's important to have more openness or less, then we can also explain our own position to the other side, and they have a chance to, to also understand us. So my understanding is that on DRM, if we really need for staff to be open, is because otherwise we cannot do our job as maintainers in the, in, the, in, the, in the kernel. Because if we cannot really test and debug the code that uh, reproduces uh, a regression, we just cannot keep doing our own job. And what happens is that if we, if we allow people to pass blobs and we don't know what is in there at all, and, and, the, and the vendor has uh, some blob that people use. What will happen is that at some point we will have a new kernel and people will complain that their stuff is broken when they upgrade. But they are using a blob we don't know what is inside it. So we cannot really figure out what broke in the kernel. And maybe we just find out that bisect and this is one feature that somebody added. Do we have to revert that feature because people are using some blob from the vendor? And we don't really know why. But I think everybody agrees that we should have a, an open enough implementation in Lib Camera. I don't think that that's, that's part of the question here. The question is what is open enough? And if there can be an alternative implementation by the vendor for that driver, something alternative to Lib Camera that the vendors can use. Uh, Hikado, yeah, that, that's uh, no question about that. It's totally fine. I mean, Hikado, vendors can create their own no, implementation. The problem have... of sending uh, blobs to the kernel, and we did deny this in the past because all the vendors wonder where to just pass this through, is that we don't want something completely undocumented. If it is, now we have Lib Camera, and I, I'm perfectly fine to receive some blob from Lib Camera, provided that Lib Camera will do the right thing. So I expect to have an open source code on Lib Camera that will be doing whatever it takes to send me a parameter. It could be just a table lookup. I mean, doesn't matter much if it is just adjusting lightning because of the sensor or because something. I don't really care uh, how those parameters are calculated from my side. I mean, not talking about uh, Lohan, but from my side as a kernel maintainer, I don't care if this is calculated using some fancy algorithm that only Intel has or only MediaTek or whatever. But what I do care is that the entire solution needs to be, to be open-sourced. Because this way, if something wrong happens, 
we can track, we can fix, and this way the use, Linux users will have a decent uh, solution for them. That's what I do care. We, we, we are slightly uh, behind schedule, about two hours. Uh, <laughs> we, we were supposed to have a 30 minutes discussion about memory allocation, and I know that we have James Jones on the, on the call uh, remotely who's interested in that. Do we, we, would, would we switch for that for? Mine. Oh, it's so much fun. Yeah, I, 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 I know, but I, I mean, Jones has been there for, uh, James has been there for two hours and a half, and I don't want to tell him, well, okay, we're not going to discuss that. Unless the room says that we don't want to, but I think it's an important topic as well. Uh, yeah, my, my, from, yeah the, my concern is that we have discussed a lot, we have said a lot, and we don't have any conclusion, and that's frustrating, right? So, we, it would be nice, I, I like your approach, like, uh, let's say, why, what do we want from the drivers, right? Uh, I think, for, I, can, I will go super fast, and if everybody promised to be super fast, we are done in five minutes. One second. So for me, what I want is that people using Chromebooks, they can use their drivers in an open way, as open as today, for the features needed by Chromebooks. And I also, as a Debian developer, what I want is exactly the same for Debian. I want to be able to use my camera with main. That's, that's my main goal. If somebody can express their different, if somebody has different goals, I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a really good exercise to do. Just regarding conclusions, uh, I recall a couple of points that I think are worth mentioning, so please con contest me if you disagree. Uh, I recall Jesse here mentioned that the, the, let's say that they would have lib camera support for IPv6, including the processing system. That quality-wise should be fine for Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it has to have some basic level of quality. It has to have some basic level of quality, but I don't think that means like everything in your pipeline necessarily has to be enabled. I don't, I mean, I don't have enough detail to know what that would look like, but yeah. Secondly, you had the blue slide that uh, discussed, discussed the use of DRM uh, in case the video for Linux can't involve, evolve uh, in the direction that better supports ISPs. I, I think there was, I guess there was rough agreement on that. Yeah, I think that's what we agree on. Sorry? The blue slide, I think we agree on. Okay. Yeah, okay, that, that, that is fine. But the, the name of the meeting was the ultimate uh, discussion about vendor pass-through. This is going to be like electing a pope. We close the doors and they will find a solution. And, and, and I think we have an agreement on that, that we say vendor pass-through is not acceptable. We don't want it, but if it happens by accident, it's fine. But what it means by accident, so if in exchange of having an open enough camera, so I, if go I, for it. Re, coming back to my, my, my point that we don't have common buffers, we, we, we basically have a, uh, parameter buffers that define the parameters for which with which to capture a frame uh, or, or process a frame using the ISP. Uh, there is no need for vendor pass through there, so but we it can wouldn't happen by accident. Can we have parameters? Not can we have in our param in our parameter buffers? Can we have parameters not documented? Why not? Saying how, so, how, can, you, saying can, you, okay? can you explain I me how it happens how, by accident? Why not? In this case? I mean. Uh, if you look at the RM system, there are lots of things that Intel, AMD, and other vendors have. They don't open it, but still the driver is open source, and still people can use the uh, GPUs and do whatever they want. So if we have these kind of things, I, I'm completely okay of having some, uh, we, we do have actually this on Video for Linux too. Not all the, the vendor, uh, get any random sensor. Usually there are a lot of uh, random values that are stored there. We don't really don't know what they do. The that and there, that's okay, I mean. Uh, and, and I think we accept that. We accept unknown values from the kernel to the, dry, to the hardware. But if we can, the, the question is, can we have buffers sent from user space where some of the registers are not defined? We don't have any documentation of them. From my side, I don't have any troubles provided that on uh, Lib Camera we have open source for that. If, even if Lib Camera, if Lib Camera doesn't touch those files, if 
if the lib camera implementation is taking the values from the calibration file and writing them to those without knowing how those calibration patterns uh, work? From my side, that's okay. From my side, uh, that's uh, up to the uh, uh, For IoT embedded markets, that's not good. But for mobile phones? For chips that can be, for ISPs that can be used in IoT, that's not good. The fact that an ISP is used in a mobile phone, that's not the relevant criteria. It's whether that ISP is also in the embedded market. Okay. And it's fine to say that we want to decide market to market and it will be a civil discussion for each one of these cases. Was it civil today? <laughs> Something like this is fine. I mean, I think we have an agreement also, and that clarifies a few things, that discrimination is fine. I, I entered the room with the impression that we shouldn't discriminate between vendors, but if the kennel committee overall think it's fine, then that's something we can do. We had a kernel maintainer showing something, saying something about NVIDIA. So we can discriminate, for sure. Uh, do you want to, do you have a different opinion? Is, is somebody having a much different opinion than this? I'm just concerned, and I'm not in the position for making this decision, but how are we going to make a call on this? I, I, th I think it, it has to be a decision from the community based on trust, based on the market. And it... Case by case. It should be case by case. Who is making that decision? That's a big question. Should be video for Linux? Should Lead be camera. camera? Should be a combination of both? I mean, I am... I'm expecting you to not be completely bananas with one specific vendor because you hate them. I don't hate them. Uh, it sounds like the requirements for lib camera would be more strict than for V4L2 because V4L2 is a kernel driver. And Maro is saying like whatever lib camera passes through and lib camera properly implements, then he's fine. So I guess the bar is on you. I think it's important to not say it's Laurent. Uh, Laurent should be uh, representative of the community f yeah. feeling at that time, and the community feeling will change. And his job is to maintain, like what I've been doing for 20 years, is like gauging the community feeling, reaching out to other people and saying, "Well, if this happened, would you be okay with?" And knowing who's, whose opinion matters and you know who's important and you know who needs to be in the room for things. And that's it's not you know it's just saying lib camera's job. It's not lib camera's job. It's the lib camera community that Laurent is going to represent, and that's you know building that community with people from each ISP as they come on board and making sure they're engaged in that. And they're, when the next ISP comes on board with like, uh, we, we, we don't want to give you this. And all the other guys, people go, well, we've already given them that. So don't accept it because we've already done, you know, reached that bar. Don't reduce the bar for them. Again, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling. It's vibes. It's not solid uh, rules you can make up. The challenging part is that the committee is fragmented today, so we'll have to keep discussing and try to find agreements. Mm -hmm. I've been discussing this for 20 years. Every LPC, I have the same discussions with the same people about the same things. It's get used to it. And, you know, and I mean, yeah. in, I assume that in the DRM community, after all those years, you have a bit of a better consensus uh, Not really. No. I mean, it's, I still, it's, it's not like you have so 50... So put it this way, right? Last year, I decided... I probably shouldn't say this out loud. I don't think I'd ever accept another CDRM driver, maybe not, in, in graphics space, at least, that's not written in Rust. I, I think I would, someone would have to really push me to not ha to accept one, because I don't see anything on the horizon, and I'm like, it's a waste of effort to start one now. I, I went ahead with that thing, you know, oh, gee, I'm going to get some pushback. I recently talked to a large company about who, a driver who I'm going to be writing in Rust, and expected the first time I talked to them about it being in Rust, they would say, what the hell, we're not getting involved, we want to do C. But they went, no, no, no we're interested, we'll talk about, we'll think about it. It's like, you, you sort of set these things in your own brain where it's like, oh, I don't think anyone will accept this. But sometimes you have to try, and sometimes you have to push it, and then you get the consensus of your community that, that that's something we should push for. And okay, so, so the IPU6 DRM driver should be in Rust. Maybe. As I said, as I said, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think of cameras when I said that. It was graphics folks. And accelerators are kind of on the edge of, yeah, I, I, I'm flexible. I said, as I, said I, I negotiate on every case every time. I don't try and set a rule because it's, yeah, it's too hard. Can we use the last 15 minutes to talk about the memory? Yeah. And thank you very much, everyone.
<laughs> around a good plate and good restaurant, we don't have these kind of discussions. No. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I have a few slides which I will try to keep really, really quick to introduce the problem. Um, I named this efficient memory allocation between different subsystems, but really it's also known as, as resurrecting the Unix device memory allocator uh, work that was proposed and based on a XDC presentation in 2016. I can't believe it's that old by uh, James Jones. Um, <clears throat> I rephrase, so th there's a link on this slide to his slide, so if you, you can grab that afterwards to, uh, to have the full details, I didn't want to make a full copy of that. But the problem statement is split in different parts. We're talking about how to handle buffer allocation. Uh, so the, how does an, uh, an application allocate image buffers that can be shared between multiple components, multiple uh, producers and consumers in the system uh, in a way that will work and that will provide optimal performance. Uh, there's a question of, Beside allocation of that memory, how do we negotiate formats? Uh, what do I need to, how do I need to configure my camera and my video encoder and my display? Uh, what pixel format should I use? What are the constraints on the strides to make sure that uh, there will be interoperability between those components? Uh, and there's an added point here compared to uh, the, the presentation from James, uh, that is cache management. How do we ensure both correctness, obviously, uh, but performance as well? So in this discussion, I'm mixing happily the words buffers, buffer objects, frame buffers, surfaces. They use for different, uh, in different ways, in different subsystems, different part of use space in the kernel. So it's a bit messy, a bit messy that we don't have a, a common vocabulary. Uh, but don't uh, don't tell me off if I'm using one word uh, instead of another because we don't have a consensus on, on all of those across uh, the whole kernel. One problem that James listed that I think is mostly solved is unsynchronization. Uh, we do have fence support in the kernel. We have support for both implicit and explicit fences. Uh, my understanding is that explicit fences is the way to go for new APIs. Um, and it's missing in video for Linux. It's not everywhere. Uh, it is in DRM. And what well, we discussed extensively before that uh, this is something that we, we want to improve in, uh, in video for Linux as well. So I don't think uh, there's really a need to, to discuss about this today. Basic use case, uh, there's a camera obviously because I'm here. Uh, you have an application in the middle and you want to display that. Um, so you want to make sure that you can allocate buffers uh, that will be able to store images from a camera being displayed without having any, uh, any memory copy in the middle. Of course, that basic use case is a bit more complicated because you do have your camera hardware and your driver, but you have lip camera uh, uh, between your application and the camera. You may even have GStream on top of that. Uh, and then on the other side for the display, you may have a, a graphical user interface toolkit, QGTK, whatever, that's going to talk to a compositor, uh, one of the different Wayland composers, uh, and on the back end, uh, your surface will be directed to uh, a GPU composition or to uh, direct composition by your display hardware through KMS directly, uh, or it's even going to be uh, composite by the, the, the CPU in some cases if you really have to do that. So from an application point of view, you don't really know and see uh, how your buffer is going to be consumed uh, or possibly in some cases exactly how it's going to be produced. Uh, your camera may DMA to the buffer directly. Uh, we have a workaround for some platforms where we're missing ISP support in LibCamera with the software ISP, so we have the CPU writing the image. Um, and the for the application, it's complete, completely transparent. And then if you add your video, video encoder, your NPU and other components into the mix, that gets even more complicated, obviously. <coughs> we shouldn't... Uh, it's supposed to be a next slide after that. Uh, okay. We shouldn't forget about a use case where, uh, well, we want to capture an image and just process that with the CPU and do nothing else. Uh, so it's not about just about sharing buffers between producer and consumers that are hardware, but that can be very simple as well. Um, so a bit of a recap. We do have multiple buffer allocations on the kernel side. So I'm not talking about generic allocate, uh, allocation APIs, but things that are suitable uh, to have buffers that uh, devices can DMA to or DMA from. Um, so we have uh, APIs in DRM, and those are mostly driver specific. Each driver will have its own IOCTLs to allocate the buffers. Um, we have APIs in video for Linux. They are generic. Uh, the backend behind them is driver specific. Each driver will select which backend it wants. The 
does it want uh, DMA contiguous memory? Can it support scattergather? Would there be an IMMU? Um, and then we have a bit more recent DMA heaps. So that's generic uh, allocators that will give you, uh, will give you a DMA buff object. Uh, and the back end behind those is selectable by the user, so by the application user space. Uh, mentioning here UDMA buff as well, uh, that allows you to wrap uh, MemFD inside a DMA buff object. I'm mentioning DMA buff a lot because that's the de facto solution today on Linux to share buffers between different components. That, I think, is not going away and it's not something that we want to reinvent. So everything has to use DMA buff object. Um, <clears throat> And those, uh, those multiple APIs are, so they're based on standard IOCTLs, device-specific IOCTLs. In a later case, it's more complicated, obviously, to, uh, to use from uh, generic applications. And they also focus specifically on the needs of the device they cater for. So video for Linux, what it will allocate a device for a camera, will not take into account GPU tiling. Um, we have nothing in the API that would take that into account. Same thing on the DRM side. Uh, DRM will make sure that or whatever, whatever DRM driver you have, you will have APIs that make sure that the buffer uh, will match the needs of your GPU for rendering or of your display engine, uh, but without thinking too much about the camera side. We have some relevant prior art, and there's a bit more than that listed in the slides from, from James. Uh, in, in user space, so we have GBM, part of Mesa, and the mini GBM, part of Chrome OS, uh, that are user space libraries uh, that will allocate buffers for you, but those are mostly targeting the display use cases and the rendering use cases, not so much certainly for GBM, not, not on the camera side. We have Gralock on Android, which does pretty much what we're trying to do today, but in a way that can't really be replicated to a generic system, because Android uh, expects system vendors to provide a Gralock implementation for their systems, and so that implementation knows what devices are present, know exactly what GPU, or know exactly what camera, or what video encoder, and the constraints of the devices. So the API exposed by Gralock is relatively high level, and when an application will say, I want to be able to capture an image from a camera, I prefer to, to capture an image from a camera, uh, Gralock will know that the camera hardware has these requirements. While on a more generic system, if you want a more generic API, that will not be the case. You can't have, you, you, you can't ship a uh, standard element in user space today that will run on random Linux systems without knowing what's in there that will make the right decision. Um, <clears throat> EGL streams, they kind of solve part of the problem as well. It's a, a Kronos API, uh, but not really something that I think can be leveraged. There's a me big memory allocation API in Vulkan. That's a big part of Vulkan, uh, which is the reason why people say that to draw a single triangle uh, in your first Vulkan program, you need 1,000 lines of code in your application. So that's fairly complicated, fairly low level, matches the needs of display and, uh, and, and rendering uh, fairly well, uh, but again, not a generic component that today can be leveraged as such. Um, so the question is, what do we do? Uh, I've brought up this topic because this is something we face in Leap Camera. We have support, we have designed the API Leap Camera to be centered around importing buffers. So we say the application should have a buffer and give it to Leap Camera so that we, capture an, we can capture an image in that buffer. And if your application today has, wants to render something and, will, and gets a buffer from uh, the display side, assuming that it gets a buffer that can be DMA2 on the display side, most likely the camera will be able to access it in, at least in the system we've been working on, uh, but there's no, there are absolutely no guarantee. Uh, so it kind of works by chance. I don't know what percentage of the time. Um, but if your application just wants to capture images from a camera and save them to, to a file, we didn't want to force those applications to go and find a source of a DMA buff somewhere, so we kind of have an allocator API in Leap Camera today. And I think that's bad because every framework, uh, every kernel API, every framework, because we don't want to force users to get something from another place that doesn't exist, there's no central allocator, uh, we duplicate all that work everywhere. Every kernel API, video for Linux, DRM, uh, have their own allocators. Uh, Leap Camera has an allocator. Uh, we have, well, GBM in Mesa for the, for the display use cases. So we do lots of the duplication there. And we would like, from a Leap Camera point of view, to see that fixed because we're running into issues with cache management, with allocation, and things like that. Um, 
I described the problem space, uh, memory allocation, that's the one I'm the most interested in. And then there's the negotiation of the format and strides and different constraints when it comes to the layout of the image in those buffers. That's a secondary, uh, from my personal point of view, at least a secondary goal. I think it's important, but less urgent for me. Um, and the question is, who would like to see this addressed? Which small subset of that group would be willing to contribute? Uh, and how we could, uh, we could make that happen. So there will be a session about this at XDC next month in October, uh, for those of you who, who plan to be there. Um, but is there anyone in the room today who's interested in this topic, thinks it's worth working on, uh, has ideas, would have an interest in working on that? So question is for the room now. Microphone? I think it would be very good to have this for, for inter interoperability to help and to help user space to, 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 to allocate memory, but I have no time to work on this. Okay, so you're part of the first group, you want to see this fixed, but you want, you want to do it yourself. Yes. <laughs> I am part of the best group. I want to get it fixed, and I think I, I, know, I, think I know who can help you on, on doing this. That means I don't have to do it. Okay. I think Thomas and mm. Ricky are your two to talk about this. Okay. So I have a query. As part of uh, your presentation, you mentioned Android is supporting, uh, there is no limitation, right? All the subsystems are supported by the Android. So Gralock in Android yes. uh, supports all the Android use cases. So you ask it for a buffer and you say, I want a buffer that the camera will write and that the display will read and that the CPU will read sometimes. Uh, rarely, but sometimes. And then it will give you what it thinks is the best buffer and the best format for that. Correct. So already there is a base which is working well, right? Can't it be taken as a reference to adopt here? Because the other models, whatever you mentioned, is only rendering related use cases. So from a functionality point of view, yes, that is something that can be done. Uh, I mean, if we're looking at the feature set, uh, because we, we want, basically we have the same goal. But the big difference is that that component in Android being shipped by the system vendor knows about the devices you have in the system. And so it can make those decisions based on that knowledge. While if we want to have a generic implementation, a generic solution that works in Linux in general uh, for all vendors, uh, we will need somehow to have a component that will be able to learn about those constraints of the different devices. So we'll probably have some, need something a bit more complex where the application knowing what it wants to do with the buffers, knowing which devices or which frameworks uh, the buffers will be produced uh, by and consumed by, uh, will need to interrogate those to get a set of constraints in some form that he can pass to a centralized place that will resolve those constraints. The constraints will ultimately come from the kernel, I assume. We may need help from the kernel for constraint resolution as well, and then allocate the memory from the right place based on the resolution of those constraints. Let me just understand one thing. You are talking basically about a new space library Eventually, of course, with kernel support, right? Or are you talking about some other subsystem in the kernel? What, what is your idea on that? So uh, I'm approaching this from a leap camera point of view because I would have loved to develop a leap camera without having an allocator and only importing buffers. Uh, and we felt the pain of having to have an allocator. Uh, and so I don't want the next framework to have to do the same. And I would like the allocator and leap camera to be removed uh, in, in the long run. So I'm looking at all the subsystems. We need something that will work for everybody. Uh, that's kind yes, of the goal. But this is, can still be. Uh, like what we have lip trace. I mean, we could have a very low level lab, uh, library on user space that Mesa, uh, uh, lip camera, and others would be used, or it could be something at the kernel, or it could be both. So what are you thinking about? We, we could look at both options, that's interesting. I think it should be indeed a shared library in user space that different components can use. My view of that is that it would mostly be used either directly by applications or at least by frameworks, yeah. uh, where GTK, for instance, would use that library to offer buffers that can be used. Uh, so you may, because this is gonna be a fairly low level API and be maybe a bit more, compl more complex to use, maybe we'll have toolkits that will help using it. Uh, but I think my, my 
goal, at least, is to be able to remove allocation from Leap Camera. Uh, so Leap Camera would only import buffers, and so Leap Camera would not use that library at least to resolve constraints and allocate the buffers, because I don't want it to allocate them. It may use that library, a part of the, the system, however, when the application will ask Leap Camera, OK, for this particular camera, if I want to capture, uh, um, capture images in memory, what are the constraints that need to be matched? And those constraints will likely be somehow opaque to the application. It's going to be something that it will get and then have to pass to the centralized allocator. That's the way I would see it. Uh, but of course, defining those constraints in a way that standardizes is something that's fairly complicated. Um, James have, uh, has uh, more details on, uh, on a proposal. He centered it a bit more, I think, on the format negotiation. Um, but uh, I think that the allocation is also also a goal there. And so there's, in the slides, there's, uh, there's more information about a few C structures and ways to express some of the constraints. Uh, some of the constraints are very easy. Do you need contiguous memory or not? Uh, what is the alignment of the stride that you need, things like that. And then you get into areas where you have vendor-specific constraints, and you have devices where you're going to capture YUV images in two planes, and the, one, the Luma plane has to be in one DDR bank, and the Chroma plane in another DDR physical bank, and things that can get fairly crazy. We've seen that more in the past, fortunately less these days. Uh, but I'm sure that if we design an API and really something that will only use simple constraint because it's all we're seeing, the next day we'll have complex ones from the vendors. Um, but that's life. Uh, so something that's extensible with new set of constraints will probably be needed. One, one more question. Between source and uh, destination, if there are different alignment requirements, allocator, take, allocator library, whatever you are talking, that takes care and give the feedback to the source if there is a misalignment? That would, be the, uh, that would be the idea. Uh, this centralized component would say, OK, if you want to capture from the camera and then encode, this is the alignment on the, on the stride that you need to have, for instance. Go ahead. James? Can you guys hear me, Andrew? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just wanted, wanted to say, say for the, the constraint, constraint stuff, stuff, I think there was some Besides the presentation you linked, um, really, with Simon Sarah did a lot more work to formalize that into an actual proposal. I think uh, two or three XDCs ago, and there's a there's a slide deck and some header sample code about, about that that uh, defines a or attempts to define the vendor agnostic way to express the constraints. And uh, one of the big open questions there was where where do you resolve those constraints? Is it in user space or should they be pushed down to the kernel? I, I'd always initially assumed the, the kernel, but then Simon Sarah kind of talk me into the user space option being valid too. But then the question is where you dispatch it to for actual allocation. And that it's complicated. That's that's a big open issue. Hard one. Do I understand correctly you'll be at XDC next month? I will be, yeah. Any other feedback on these? Yeah, Hans? I guess if you really want to support all the random vendor specific cases as well, then I can't think of any other way than that you, uh, the allocator would have to have knowledge about the devices involved and ask those devices specifically. So make a proposal, is it working? Uh, um, uh, I, I suspect it might be extreme. So I remember at a DMA, when DMA buff was first uh, initiated, I was actually, was it also for Bloomberg? I don't know. I was at the same uh, room as well. and. Um, the DMA buff is kind of ignoring all this, right, today. So I think we had a, a very short discussion there as well. My idea was, uh, oh, what, what, a lot, what requirements do you have? Contiguous, scatter together, weird. Uh, so the first two would be easy, and now we have some additional requirements as well. But um, vendor specific is really hard. And would you be, would it be worth all the effort? Uh, on another question, by the way, because for video for Linux uh, and DRM for that matter as well, you also have to synchronize, you know, depending on the format. So when you allocate, you want to say, okay, you want to buffer, then they also, presumably somehow you either need to pass that format or you use the currently defined format. Uh, and the only way I think you can, can implement this is if you actually can go to the devices themselves and say, okay, this is, 
you can, for example, you ask DRM first and then say, this is the proposal from DRM, and then Video for Linux will say, oh, well, yeah, uh, close, but no cigar, but let's try this and perhaps go back. I have no idea. This is an extern it's very complicated method, but trying to support everything, all the weird stuff, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, whether it's worth the effort or whether we should just um, go to a decent sets of features, and if you can't support that, then uh, you have to do it on your own. You have to figure it out yourself. Good questions. Uh, when it comes to going to the device, I think we'll have to indeed, uh, to get the constraints from the devices, possibly also for the constraint resolution. Uh, it's not entirely clear, but certainly it's the device. Uh, ultimately, it's the device driver that will know about the constraints. Uh, that's where the knowledge uh, needs to come from. I hope that we would be able to um, split uh, the, the, the two and, and handle the two problems of uh, format negotiation and uh, buffer location separately. So first negotiate a format, say, okay, uh, I end up having this pixel format, this tried, because I know that's gonna work. And then after that, we get to the allocator saying, okay, now allocate a buffer that's suitable for those uh, with the size that's needed for that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that would be the case. If we, if we have to combine both and handle both at the same time, it becomes even more complicated. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we'll have to experiment with something and see, see how that goes. At least part of this, we have already on uh, Gstreamer. I mean, it already does all these negotiations with different devices and even on different parts of Gstreamer itself, in terms of format negotiation, uh, in terms of uh, stride and things like that. So at least part of this you already have somewhere. So maybe it would be a matter of just picking those parts of the code and placing on a library. That's but a very then, good idea. Yeah. Uh, we do have indeed negotiation of capabilities between pads in GStreamer, so we could look at how it's done and either get inspiration for, uh, from that. I'm not sure if we'd be able to reuse some of the code because I assume it's kind of tied with the rest of GStreamer, but at least looking at how it's done and see uh, what concepts they have there, that could be useful. If, if my memory serves, and I might be wrong, it might or it might have been changed, I think GStreamer is always allocating the buffers from DRM. So if Video for Linux would have more strict requirements, then it would fail. But I, this may have changed. So this no, I guess it's changed. I guess. Uh, on the allocation side, indeed, it would do that on the consumer, at least by default. I think maybe you have, um, I, I don't know exactly how it's working today, and things may have changed indeed. <clears throat> but when it comes to resolving constraints, what is the stride that is needed? Uh, that is something that I think uh, GStreamer does. Uh, and, and, and using a pixel format that will work for, for all the components, that is something that GStreamer does. I so have to, 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 to touch on this code once when we are trying to do some uh, DMA buff implementation uh, that was back in Samsung days, so it was like uh, seven years ago maybe. But I do remember that um, it does a negotiation, it gets all the information it needs from the, both DRM and video for Linux side. So from the, the query point of view, it would have everything there. Of course, it has its own in instructions inside the gestion. You won't be wanting all that complexity on your library, but that part is solved. Maybe the only part that may require is about SCADA gather or continuous memory, so yes. this is a little bit more. Yes. We we have, I, I mentioned the DMA heaps that we have in the kernel today. Uh, I think that could be a, a, way, uh, a way forward. Uh, today we only have in mainline, I think, two different heaps, so that's fairly limited, but I think that will grow. Uh, and so using that as the backend allocator would probably be, uh, be possible, but we'll need to resolve constraints to make sure we select the right heap with the right parameters. Uh, it's missing a few things, like there's no accountability on the, the memory that, uh, that you locate, but VFL2 has the same thing. If you have uh, C groups and, you know, and if you have limits on the memory that an application or process can allocate, uh, that is not enforced by buffer location in, uh, in video for Linux or in DRM. Neither it is in DMA heaps, but I think that could be fixed. And it would probably be easier to fix that once in DMA heaps than having to fix it twice in DRM and VFL. 
Um, so I think centralizing allocation around DMA heaps is, uh, would be a good idea, but we still need to know how, what heap to use with what parameters. Right now, between uh, graphics and display, GBM defines set of formats. But uh, defining one more uh, allocator, right, it can bring its own set of the uh, format definitions, right? How they can coexist? That's a very good question. That's, that's one of the reasons why I think GBM is not a solution as such today, because it caters for the needs of graphics and rendering. Um, could it be extended with additional formats? Certainly. I mean, probably uh, going to be a bit of work, because when we look at things, we looked at YUV allocation, buffer allocation in, uh, was that in mini GBM or in GBM itself? Yes, and that's, I mean, the, the code was clearly meant for, for the graphic side, so we would need, but, but that's a technical problem. Uh, the, even if we have to refactor and rewrite lots of things internally, that's a technical problem. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure what else than ad adding new formats would be needed there, but it's something we can definitely look at. Um, I think it's designed around the GB, the DLM formats. So that, when we look into that for YUV formats, we have, we would have need to go through DRM people, convince them that uh, YUV, I think, was a suitable format, wasn't needed, and they don't need that for graphics. So we have to define, in, that, in this case, I think a superset of the format that GBM currently support would be needed. MB12 is one example, right? I don't recall, but there are some formats that are missing, certainly. There's some limited YUV support, I think, for some formats that are relevant to graphics, but uh, James raised his hand. Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted, wanted to, to say, I think, 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 Method with the, the, the format, format which is just incomplete, incomplete for, for other, other systems. systems. And um, um, the format, format modifier mechanism for like, like negotiating the format, format and, and, and the layout, layout of the buffer, buffer um, for that, for that, that memory. memory. Um, but, but, but it is all, all, it all falls all apart. apart. You, don't you don't want to use very simple layouts. layouts. Uh, and, and you want to do anything like device locality. locality. Because all, all the allocators, GBM is defined in terms of allocating more or one graphic device, one specific graphic device. If you want right. to allocate for even like, like a thing that's it's not a graphic device, device like a display or a video or, video or, video or, video or anything like that, that. Um, it's just, just not the right API, API yet. 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 Um, yet. It does, it does do a great, great job of allocating graphic graph graph device or a device. device. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. Any other input from the room, or do we call it today? We can call it today, but just to mention that one specific pain point was also mapping formats. Between the camera side and the DRM side, we got issues there because while the format definition is different, the, but the concept here is the same, but there might be things in the middle that requires you to do the mapping in a device-specific way. So. Yes, and, and VFAL2 and DRM both use false ECs to define pixel formats, and then you have Identical formats that use two different phone CCs on the two sides, or different formats that use the same phone CC, and it's it's always great. Like you call RGB 24, 24 in uh, in V 2 is actually BGR 888 in DRM, and it's just <laughs> that and that's lots hard of headaches. to fix right now because I mean. We, we, they we, grow and separate, so... Yes, we have a big table that converts between the two in Lip Camera, and that has been tested. So if you ever wonder which GRM format corresponds to what v 2 format, look in the Lip Camera source code. That's, that is a source of, tr of truth at the moment. Maybe we need this unique definition of the of the uh, of four CCs in Linux. That mm. what's the uh, number of the XKC XKCD when we, we, we need a new standard to... Uh, yeah. There are other relevant standards, actually. There's a Kronos standard that's called the Kronos Data Format Specification, I think. Uh, so it's not about p um, pixel formats as for CCs, but it's about describing the exact layout of a pixel format, and that takes hundreds of bytes uh, to do the description. But that is standardized. So it's not something that could be used as a format identifier towards, uh, towards components, 
but it's fairly useful if you want to clearly uh, describe a format in a way that's possible by a machine. Uh, but it's oriented, uh, it's meant for graphics because it's Kronos API. Kronos is mostly so far about graphics. Uh, it's gonna change a bit with uh, the, the work doing, uh, we're, going there, uh, we're doing there with four cameras. Uh, so that spec could possibly be extended at some point. It could be part of the, the solution, uh, but not, not as a format identifier probably. Right, three, two, one. Thank you very much.